This episode of Chicago's Bravest Stories is brought to you by Fire Consultant Corporation. Fire science is a field full of passion, excitement, and valor. Although the brothers and sisters of the firefighting industry are all cut from a different cloth, the one trait that weaves everyone together in firefighting industry is the hunger to do something with meaning. If this same passion drives you and you're interested in the fire science EMS career, Fire Consultant Corporation can be your guiding light to a successful professional journey. Fire Consultant provides learning workshops that will educate you on what it takes to become a firefighter. Each workshop is filled with concise, high-quality, step-by-step information on the world of fire science and EMS. Go to fire-consultant.com to find out more information on their next workshop and to find their social media handles to keep updates on everything fire science and EMS. This episode also brought to you by FNX Supplements and Apparel. If you're in need of great, reliable, and safe supplements to help you through the hard workouts, look no further, FNX, premier supplement and fitness apparel supplier. Founded by athletes like Brooke Entz, Camille LeBlanc Bazinet. All their gear and supplements uh, follow strict guidelines set forth by the World Anti-Doping Association and are stri- strictly regulated by the FDA. With no fillers, no tainted ingredients, they have pre-workouts, super greens, proteins, recovery, and CBD. Check them out at fnxfit.com. And if you use the referral code Chicago's Bravest, you'll get 15% off their supplements and workout apparel. Again, fnxfit.com and use our referral code Chicago's Bravest and get 15% off. Thanks again for listening. Okay, we're back. We had to take a quick break to refill the cocktails and what have you. So where did we leave off? Where are you in your career now? You, uh, you're crossing I over. I don't remember. We've, we've been going off on tangents. <laughs> off on tangents. So, uh, so I crossed over, long story short, Academy was awesome. Yeah. Um, you had a good Academy? Yeah, we, we had no issues. A little bit of not normal stuff, but nothing crazy. Okay. We had very good instructors. Steve Chikorotis was in charge of the program, so how could it not be good? Right. A, a prince, a gentleman, and a guy that knows more than I ever will. You know, been more fires, but just a really great guy. He's probably he, busier now than he was when he was. Oh, he's a movie star. Yeah. He's a movie star, you know. <laughs> I, I tease him about it all the time, but Chick is one of the best guys going. Um, we teased him because we were predominantly a medic class. So uh, we told him we, we wanted a pink guide on for when we were running. <laughs> so he would not give us a pink guide on. This is a true story. So we told him magenta. He was able to find a magenta guide on for the pike pole, you know, when you yeah. run, when you're a candidate. And uh, we gave him a magenta spoke, sport coat when we retired. We had it custom made for him. We had, <laughs> we had to go to the Jewish tailors on Roosevelt Road when they were still in business. And they were like, magenta? Yeah, actually, we have that. <laughs> <laughs> and, huh. we, and we gave Seems it to been laying around for the yeah. last 15 years. <laughs> no, not on Roosevelt Road, not at that time no, of year. They have plenty of magenta right. and fuchsia in stock. So, is, it, uh, is it the one right by the academy, that Taylor right uh, yeah, down right the street? Yeah, right around the corner. Yep, oh. we had it made for him. That's the place still around. The place is still there? Yeah. Yes. No, we had good seasoned instructors. I'm trying to think who was there. Uh, uh, a guy that just retired. Man, I'm having a brain fart. Um, and the 14th Battalion, Greg... Forget the last name. He's going to kill me. He's going to text me after the show and say, I can't believe you forgot my name. Well, it'll be, it'll be a couple of days. We'll, uh, we'll edit it back in when it comes to you. Yeah. That, that's to assume that Greg is one of the 14 people that are listening to us right now. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I was telling uh, uh, Tim on the way in here that, uh, Corey, you can attest to this. Our social media went crazy. Oh, God. Yeah. Almost brought the house down. Yeah. Well, that's good like, for you guys because I think no, it's a really – uh, I've been listening since Father Tom was your first broadcast, right? Yes. Well, uh, Jeff Rich and then Father Tom, right? Oh, I didn't, li- I didn't listen to Jeff. I listened to Father Tom because I'm a big fan, but I've been listening to all of them since. I listened to Jimmy and I listened oh, wow. to Kevin. And, you know, it's, it's, it's great to reminisce and yeah, well, you think know what, what other people think. What we're trying to do think here. What, think, hear what other people think is the right. correct term. We're, we're trying to preserve some of the history. Like, you know, like trying to get these stories that Father Tom was talking about and getting those on – um, before it's lost to generations, you yeah. know, uh, just trying to preserve some of that history. And, you know, now people can look back on it and listen and like hear the stories straight from father Tom's mouth. 
You yeah. know, he had, he had some amazing stories, you know. Probably one of the best that. storytellers ever. Oh, and, the, and the greatest homilies, if, are you guys all Catholic? Yes. Yeah, right. So homilies blow, right? <laughs> right. Yes. For, for, 99% of all homilies, homilies at any parish blow, except Father Tom's. <laughs> Nobody could crush it like Father Tom. I mean, it's a too bad he's a priest because the guy could get laid every Friday night <laughs> with somebody different. And yes, just, Father Tom, I said it. Just, just crushing it like uh, the Rolling oh, Stones. Oh yeah, he's out of his every... mind. The guy, the guy can, the guy can bring, strike up a conversation with anybody, anywhere, any place, anytime. And I mean, you see women, married women at retirement parties, looking at him like. This guy's a priest. Are you shitting me? <laughs> what a waste. Well, you know, I I knew like how well spoken and articulate he was, but you know, th that was our second podcast and right. we, you know, we're still f figuring things out. Father Tom sits down, grabs a microphone and it was just off to the races. We I mean, we were just blown away. He just he the way he spoke and the stories, I mean, I was just sitting there captivated. Yeah, yeah, he's you know. that's he used to when I was a young fireman at 116's house, which was where I went after the academy. He would come for lunch every Thursday that we worked, and he was invited by my two officers, Joe Finneran, who is uh, Ray Finneran's dad. Ray Finneran's still on a job, I believe. He's, Ray just got promoted. He's a lieutenant, I think. Unfortunately, he ended up in the bureau. He got promoted off a of truck 41, and then Billy Nolan was the captain there and Billy Nolan was an old plasterer. That's what we used to call him. <laughs> he was, he was a plasterer by trade. Oh, uh, not Plast like, not getting, like not getting plastered. Plastered. Yeah. No, oh, okay. plaster, actual physical plasterer, like plastered a couple houses that I bought after I got on the job. And his, his son is Bill Nolan Jr. And he's one of the deans over at Mount Carmel high school now. So the Nolan family at Mount Carmel high school, a uh, huge tradition. I did not go there, but Brian McCardle did. Well, before uh, before we uh, press the record button, you were actually talking about Father Tom and your admiration for him, and uh, you had a couple stories about that. Yeah. So early when my wife and I first, and you can you can record this. It's going. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I want him to hear this. So uh, when my wife and I first got married, and we we chose not to have a family right away. Deb was an ER nurse, and there's probably a lot of paramedics on the street that still know her. She's been an ER nurse in the city, U of C, Trinity. Uh, St. Mary's, pretty much her whole career. She became a nurse practitioner a few years ago, so she kind of, but she was still working in the ER at U of C as a nurse practitioner and U of I. So there's people that come up to me and they're like, you're married to Debbie Walsh? I was like, yeah. They're like, you're out over your skis big time. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's a whole other story on a whole other day. We could do a whole podcast on that. Yeah. But long well, story God short. God bless her right now, too, with yeah. all this nonsense. How about on. it? Oh. How about it? And, uh, and, my, and my son's an ER nurse, my middle guy at Mercy. So if you run into Mercy Hospital, my son, Kevin Walsh, is an ER nurse at Mercy. So, okay. yeah, so he's there all the time now. He's been banging both ends and making a lot of overtime money since all this stuff started. But long story short, our first child passed away when we got married of uh, heart defect, inoperable heart defect. It was called left hypoplastic left heart. Couldn't be fixed. Uh, she was a candidate for a heart transplant at the time. Heart transplants weren't very uh, good. They weren't articulate, would maybe give you 10 years of lifespan and kind of not a very good life. So my wife and I sat down <clears throat> at U of C with Father Tom. And Father Tom was, not to get emotional, it's hard, I'm Irish. That's all right. So, but Father Tom was a godsend, especially for Deb. He checked in on Deb till the day he retired. He would find out where, she, where she was, where she was working, and he would just pop in and say, hey, Deb, how's it going? You good? Everybody good? You still putting up with Tim? I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but he was just a, he was a prince of a man, and, and talk about a man that catered to his flock. I don't think that guy ever missed a baptism. He baptized all my sons after our first child, Aaron, passed away in our backyard. He never missed a wedding. He never missed a baptism. He never missed anything. And I think if you spoke to any family in the fire service, because he's now the chaplain for the International Association of Firefighters, so his reach is big and strong. And he spoke last year when I was there in uh, Colorado Springs for the passing of Juan Busio. The man is articulate beyond belief. He says the right thing all the time. And it's always emotional, whatever he says. It's always very good. So yeah, I mean, he's he's been the beacon of the... Fire department for you know, and it's you know, 
my interactions with him have been minimal, but every time I've sat down and talked with him, I'm just like completely consumed by yeah, him talking. Just captivated. Yeah, by you, him. you. There's something about that man um, that you know. You just sit back and I, I'm, I want to hear him talk all day. Yeah. And you know, we talked about that. We have to have him back on because we couldn't cover. Oh no, you have to have him back right. on. I mean, the guy is worth six, seven, eight hours of, of content easily. Yeah. I mean, he. I think he started fanning in the fire department before the strike. I, that, I think. Really? He, yeah, I think he 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 alluded to something like that. Yeah. Um, but uh, you, you know, just amazing man, and you know, we were fortunate enough to have him on, and um, it really we can really attribute some of our. Um, uh, listeners early fact, fuck ups yeah. oh well, yeah. Oh, yeah okay <laughs> that people wanted to tune in and listen to Father Tom yeah oh yeah he's a great yeah. guy he's a great guy um, so you you said that you went to 116 you got 116 right out of the academy so listen to the companies that were available when we all crossed over and this is no bullshit this is like ridiculous this is like the who's who of fire companies that they were making ALS there was 117 95 123, 116, 126, and there were a couple others that I'm remiss about. So, well, you take those same companies, and those are on everybody's um, wish list Top picks. when they so they, when they come we, out. Of the there were all, yeah, they were all cherry spots that were available to to go to. So at the time, and at the time, Pat Kehoe's father was Pat Kehoe Senior. He was two one five. He was the chief of operations for the fire suppression side. And uh, back then, it was like, well, where do you want to go? What do you want to do, <laughs> right? So, I mean, there was an actual conversation in class, which there is sometimes with many candidates. Um, but Pat was in my class crossing over, so we kind of... Did you have awards uh, where you could win a spot? Did you have that back no. then? No. No, no there, academics, no did, physical? Um, I don't... I, no, I don't recall. There was none of that. I don't recall any of that in the class we were in. Like I said, we probably had about four or five retreads from the civilian class that couldn't pass that were still in the academy. And then we went through with some, and Greg Kirkcab is the name that I couldn't remember. <laughs> I remember when you were talking earlier, um, Greg Kirkcab. He tuned out already. Yeah, no. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> he's, 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 he's a great guy, man. He was instrumental in my career. He, yeah. he was always a sounding board for me. He got promoted long before I did. He was a fireman before me. He was a go-to guy that I could call and pick up the phone and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking about. Am I doing this right? And he would always be very honest with me. Oh, it's just off you. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the way the job works. You have to have people that you can reach out to. And, uh, yeah, so long story short, I went to 116. It was not my first choice. What was your I, first choice then? 123 was my first choice. Okay. And uh, I had some baggage that you were talking about earlier. So right before I crossed over, um, not long before that, was when we were going through the struggle with what shift the paramedics were going to. And I opened my pie hole after a very heated union meeting with Danny Fabrizio. <laughs> And Danny Fabrizio was my friend. I think he did a great job as union president at the time. And uh, it was heated, and he was MF and me, and I was MF and him, and it was in a room of people. And I said, God's honest truth, I, we ended up, there was three or four guys in my car, we ended up giving Fran Spielman a ride back to the L train at 43rd Street. And I was speaking my mind in front of Fran, Fran Spielman, and that's when I learned that... Uh, that was probably not a good idea. And I said some things that I paid for, uh, not brutally, but I, I got called on the carpet for, I think my statement was, because guys will call me and say, I can't believe you didn't say what you said. I think I said that firemen just, they don't want to do anything. They want to go on ambulance runs. They just want to lay on the couch and watch TV. Something to that effect. Somebody will pull it up and send it to me after you guys broadcast this. <laughs> but I did say it. I owned it. I said that I said it. Uh, I went into work the next morning. It was on the front page of the trip, or front page of the Sun Times at the time. So, needless to say, I believe I was at uh, one twenty nine. Oh man, one twenty nine, one twenty nine that day. Yeah, and uh, the phone rang off the hook, the Marshall line. And uh, some guys were polite, allowed me to explain. Some guys were not so polite. Totally their prerogative, and I owned it. And this is relatively early in your fire suppression career. This was right before I crossed over. Oh, okay. So you were you were still. So a I knew at this time. that 116 was a pretty salty house with salty guys there, that I was gonna get uh, a pretty good candidate awakening when I got there, and I did, and I deserved every minute of what I got. Yeah. 
yeah. right? Both from the squad and from the senior guys that were on the engine. Um, but looking back at it now, it was uh, very instrumental in uh, breaking me down as a person and making sure I knew that what I needed to do and what I needed to go. And, and I'm still learning about, you know, engaging my brain before I engage <laughs> my mouth. That's been a lifelong struggle for me. But I, I mean, one of the, probably the first few weeks that I was there, I, I stood up and I apologized for what I said and uh, apologized for offending anybody that I offended, which was a word at the time that probably nobody had ever heard of. Yeah. Um, and those guys were very good to me. I just asked for a fair shake. Please just give me a fair shake. And I think because those guys gave me a fair shake in that house that I was always able to give everybody else that came after me or before me or anybody that I ran into as a company officer a fair shake. I didn't always... Uh, you get a lot of phone calls on this job. You do, you do, you do. Hey, that guy's a jag off. That girl's a pain in the ass. Yeah, maybe they were when you worked with them that day or at that house or wherever you were. But I always want, always came under the belief that until proven to me, until you prove to me that you're an asshole, you're not an asshole. You get a fair shake sure. and we'll see how things go from here. And that's what those guys did for me at that house. And that's even a, a, a bigger issue on the ambulance when it's just the two of you. And somebody's going to be like, hey, you're working with so-and-so. That person's horrible. Or, you know, and you hear the stories. But I'm, I'm like you, you know, prove me prove me wrong. Correct. You know. Yeah. Um, right. Maybe you had a bad most, day. Maybe there right. was something going on with your family. Maybe yeah. your marriage wasn't going well. One of your kids yeah. was sick. Maybe the guy who's telling me you're a load or a jerk was a jerk himself or right. herself. Right. right. You don't know. Um, and uh, a lot of the times... It works out fine, and I'm, you know, uh, it works out fine. You know, I, I luckily I'd like to say that um, less less times than most, it's not what people are telling me about this person. No, you um, have to. I, I think one of the things that, that I learned after that episode, and I probably didn't do it in, in my career when I was young, as a single role, Kevin McAuliffe, another great partner that I had. That retired a few years ago, former policeman, very opinionated, but a technically proficient paramedic, excellent, one of my f greatest friends on this job because he always said what was on his mind, never sugarcoated anything, and he'll laugh when he hears me say this. But you got to give everybody the benefit of the doubt, always, right. until they until they burn their bridge with you. And with me, it takes a really long time to burn your bridge. Yeah, you know, I'm not a big and. Corey was teasing me about it when I first got here. I'm not a big rank guy. I was raised by guys where rank rank only matters on an emergency run or a fire ground, and it only matters for the time that you're there. The actual stuff that goes around in the firehouse and who you associate with and the people that you're around, that's not rank. That's your family. And uh, the further you go up the chain, the more people that you're supposed to take care of. That's the way I was raised by... You know, uh, Ray Orosco and Bobby Hoff and Dick Keating and uh, Joe Finneran and Billy Nolan. And uh, we'll talk more about Joe and, and Billy in a minute. Those were my first two company officers. Very instrumental in how I approach people and what I did. Because Billy Nolan was the captain of the house at the time on the squad. And he was he was like, you know, Timmy. When you, when you got there? When I got there, you got a lot of baggage, Tim. <laughs> you know, you made some mistakes there, <laughs> big fella. We're going to have to figure this out. And he used to talk with... Both hands in his ear, he was in the air, and he was right out. His mom and dad were right off the boat from Ireland, and he raised, I think, six or seven kids in his family. He was a father at the time, he had kids in college. He was very, a very uh, patriarchal company officer. Never, never swore, never mean. Um, always sought the good in people, and uh, just a great guy to be, you know, to be learning from. I mean, it, all hell could be breaking loose. And he's dead now. Billy's dead and Joe Finner and her dead. And uh, <clears throat> we would go to fires and Billy would say to one of us young guys, and there were young guys on the engine, all the young guys, Brent Mahalik, uh, Timmy Cosgrove, Brian McArdle, Bobby Smith was a senior man. He'd say, hey, fellas, could you please go over there and break that window? <laughs> right? And he'd be crawling on his bellies. Hey, Timmy, would you please crawl over there and get that window for me? I need a little bit of air. And I'd be on a, I'd be on air, right? I'd be on my SCBA. He wouldn't wear one. And uh, yeah, Cap, no problem. Thank you. 
You know, I mean, just a true gentleman. <laughs> like, like you were ordering meat at the Yeah, deli. like you were like, ordering <laughs> a meal at a, fa- at a fine restaurant and never upset about anything. Finneran was the same way. And I think I was telling you when we were walking in, I was telling Corey before we started recording, here's a man whose first day on the job was the McCormick Place burned down. Oh, yeah. His first day on the job in Engine 8, right? Korean War veteran. What, do you, what year would that be? Google it. Google it. Why don't you guys grab your phone and Google what year that was. That was his first day on the job, first full day. So long story short, I come there and he tells me, hey, listen, here's how we operate here. We do, this is District 5 headquarters and we do what we're supposed to do here. And, but we do, we drill, we do tox, we do ambulance runs and we go to fires and that's our day. And when all that is done, that your time is your own. 1967. So 1967 was uh, Joe's first day on the job. Jo- oh. Joseph Francis Finneran, one of my all-time favorite men on this job. And Ray Ray and his sister are going to get upset that I'm talking about him. Not upset, unhappy, um, upset, happy that I'm talking about him. Because he had a huge impact on everybody that worked for him. Every guy that worked for him as a fireman was a company officer or chief officer. Every guy. To, to be able to get that him. That was the impact. That- yeah, he had a huge impact John McNicholas was his candidate. Terry O'Donnell, Will Trezick, uh, Mike Kamer, who's a chief now, Jimmy Corbett, me. Um, he had a huge impact on the job because of the way he conducted himself as a lieutenant. And he did everything every day the way it was supposed to be done. He's one of the only guys I know that would get to work at 5 in the morning, have coffee for about 45 minutes. He'd be in the tower by 545. He would not leave the tower. He would make a plate at lunchtime, go back up and eat in the tower, because there's a tower at 116's house. He would come down and make a plate at dinner and go back up in the tower, and Captain Nolan would go with him, right? Those guys sat in the tower all day like old school company officers did. Not a lot of firehouses did that. Yeah. But if you had first watch and you were like 30 seconds late at 22, 30, right? He'd be <laughs> ringing that bell, first watch, first watch, first watch, first watch on the one arm, right? But he was just a prince of a man, and uh, he'd be up at, f- I, the guy never slept. And he loved this ALS stuff that was really new to him. And I don't know if Ray, I don't know how old Ray was. I was there in 1998. We'll have to call Ray and find out how old he was when I went there. But he was very accommodating about the whole ALS thing. And at 116, our program was we treated everybody the best that we could, and we got onto the curb. That was the program because we didn't want to miss a fire. So the guys that I worked with that were on the engine, uh, Bobby Smith and Brian McCardle, Brent Mahalik, Mark Sullivan, Timmy Cosgrove, our engineers were uh, Brian Bauer and uh, Billy was the engineer before uh, for Brian. They were like, fine. As soon as we could get somebody to the curb and we can give them to the ammo, so we were available for the fire or another ammo run. That was the way we operated. And uh, I still think you see some ALS companies doing that in busy neighborhoods. The West Side is is still like that. Yeah. Um, but I've been, you know, my last assignment as a company officer, I was, I, I, uh, I was a relief captain in the 5th District, and so one of the last, I was still being used as a paramedic until I got assigned to squad one. But um, what, uh, can you tell us about your first fire? My first fire? Yeah, I can. Okay. Um, I don't It's going to be with 116? It was with 116. Okay. Um, It was a two and a half story frame with a fire on the second floor, pretty much common there. And the way it was there was um, the senior man usually had the pipe for the day, and you were given an assignment, either a heel man or, or a hydrant person. And we pulled up. I think I was on the heel, and Bobby Smith told me, he said, hey, you take the pipe. I'll back you up. And I didn't know until we got there. So who, who, who told you to take the pipe? Bobby Smith. So he's still one of my best friends of, of all time. He's retired, still healthy, still living a good life. He's up in the Northwoods. Great guy. Very salty. Was... Uh, He's my friend now. When I was a candidate, he wasn't my friend. That's another story I'll tell you about in a minute. But you won him over. It took a long time. He's a very, he's like uh, like your dad. That was the relationship we had probably yeah. for my first three years that I knew the man. But I learned a lot from him. He had been on busy companies. He was on 38 and Tower 10. 116 was his third assignment. He retired as a fireman off of Squad 5. The guy went to a ton of fires. And uh, long story short, he said, hey, Tim, you take the pipe, I'll back you up. So it wasn't. Anything crazy, second floor fire, go up the stairway, put up the stairwell out, 
put the one room out. I think it was the living room right off the stairs. And that was my first fire. Yeah, I remember that fire. I remember him telling me I did a good job. It was weird, yeah. right? Because here's a guy that had been pretty much... Uh, probably I, worked with the best of them. I probably wouldn't say that he, that he was mean because that would be a, an improper term. He was doing what a senior man was doing. I, You know, when I made mistakes, he told me about him. He was honest about it. But if I had a question, he would teach me as well. He was not mean about his ability to teach, nor was Finneran, you know, as the, as the company officer. And that was the benefit of being there. And we, we got a lot of work. We got a lot of ambulance work. We got a lot of fire runs. You know, it was not uncommon for all three guys on the engine to have their own uh, line. They're a quick water company. They had been a quick water company for a long time. Deck gun was always in play. Dropping the tank when we pulled up was always uh, in play. Every, everybody had their own line? Everybody had their own line. That's no shit. So uh, Finneran was, Joe Finneran and Dick Keating and Pat Kehoe Sr. all came from that area, neck of the woods. And that's kind of where Quickwater uh, was invented. So Quickwater, for the younger guys that don't know, the standard engine, engine operations order came out. I think it's still in service, 1983, if you were just studying. And Chicago was using Quickwater before other fire departments had even thought about it. So what they were doing was they were using tank water before they had a hydrant. They were flowing water freely. And if you were the hydrant person uh, or hydrant man, as they called, I'm saying hydrant person to be right. politically, politically correct. correct. Yeah. Um, you came back, if there was another line to be had after you made the hydrant, you let out another line. And it was not uncommon to pull up on a big fire where there was plenty of fire shown out the window on the A side where somebody would, the officer would yell deck gun when the second up person would go to the deck gun and the pipe off, pipe man would get a lead out. And then as soon as the second up person got off the deck gun, they lead out another line and then you would bring another line as the third person. So it was all responsibility for the hydrant guy. Yeah, but heck, you know, where else? I mean, you hear about some of these companies now in, in the suburbs that are working with low manpower. Right, and they're like, we can't do that. I just saw a video the other day of Engine 84. This is no shit. It's on my Facebook page. You can pull it up right now because I posted it. Not Engine 84, Engine 62. Engine 62 pulls up as a second engine on the far south side in Roseland. Uh, like 100 and... I think we posted that video. You too. did, 113th yeah. in Indiana. And the officer, and I love those guys over there. I spent a lot of time there as a chief. They're a top shelf fire company. They're aggressive. They go to work. They, there's no messing around. They're calm. They're cool. They're professional. They're driving down the block, and they can see one of the firemen. You can see, hear him in the back seat. He said, hey, Cap, there's a civilian. In the doghouse. On the doghouse. Yeah. So they take the alley, right? They take the alley. They, they drop the straight frame. They take the 24. They go over the raids of 24. They make the rescue, right? And they... The civilian is ambulatory. They get the ladder of the civilian. And you hear the captain say in the video, this is the best part. I got him. Go get a line. Lead out. Right? So, and they, and I can hear the hydrant man saying, hey, Cap, I'm going to get a hydrant. You want a hydrant? Yeah, go get a hydrant. So it sounds to me just like from the video that they're on a variance. Right? So here's a three, a four-person engine company. They got a dedicated driver, but a company officer making a rescue by himself. Fireman going on the hydrant. Another fireman leading out a line. And they end up putting that fire out. So I think... You know what? And, and Core and I were talking about this a little bit earlier. It's all how you're raised, right. Yeah. right? It's how you're raised. It's how you're groomed as a young person on the job, whether it be a medic or a firefighter. If you're raised by really good people that keep you honest and tell you, hey, you know what? That's, you can't do that. That's horrible. But do this instead. And you put that in your trick bag, like we were talking about earlier, and it goes in your Rolodex where I see this, I do that. That's how you learn. And you're a product of your environment, right? So depending on timing and luck and environment, those three things in my mind all factor in uh, to who you become as a paramedic or a firefighter on the fire department. That was a really cool video. Yeah. It was a great video. <clears throat> yeah. Those guys took that line up the ladder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, it, you know what? It's it, like, it's just, I look back on people that I admire and and guys who brought me up and like one of the like one of the one factors that they all had was like they were just all humble guys like they were all no one was scared to say like you know i showed up we did this this and this on this one fire i fucked it up 
Like, yeah. I did this wrong. And then I, you know, I ended up learning and going back to your, you know, like, like the, like the instance that you manage, you know, your experiences, it's, it's not, you know, a lot of times you do some good things, but a lot of times, and, and I remember you in, in classes, Tim, I remember you telling me like, it was, if you think you know everything on this job, then you're then fucking retire. Yeah. Get the fuck out of here. Because yeah, another they, they, guy that was whatever. Yeah, another guy that was at that house, Pat Lynch, who's a Vietnam veteran, a guy that had been in a lot of fires, worked on busy companies. Mm -hmm. He he always used to say, Timmy, big guy, be a student of the game. Right. And it's not a game about what, what we do, but if you if you think that you know all the answers, like Corey was saying, that's the day you gotta go. Right. Cause you don't. It changes so fast. There's so much new stuff coming along all the time that uh, it's never gonna change. Or it, it is going to change. It changes so rapidly that if you're not involved in it, you're just going to have an issue with it. So from being at 116, is that what made you want to go to the squad? Because you, oh, absolutely. you went from, you know, the engine to the squad um, in that progression, right? Straight yeah. So from 116 straight to the squad. Yep. So purely luck, right? I think you and I talked about this, or Corey and I talked about this before we started recording, all about timing. So right after I crossed over in 98, I think in early 99, there was a lieutenant's test. So everybody in the house was studying for lieutenant. So I was like, eh, I'll study. I'll study for <laughs> lieutenant. I can't be a lieutenant, but I'll study. So we had a study group in the uh, firehouse, and Ray Roscoe led the study group. He showed us what to study and how to study and probably what would be on the test. He didn't know, but he kind of gave us a, a, a parameter of what we should do and how we should operate. And we took it all. We all took it pretty seriously. So long story short, I think four or five guys off my platoon got promoted, like in 2000, after the list came out. And seven guys got promoted off of squad five at the time, because there was, excuse wow. me, there was other guys studying off the other shifts. So seven guys got promoted off of the squad, and how many guys are on that squad at that time, total? Uh, probably no more than 18 or 20. So, so that's a good chunk of guys. A third of guys we lost a third of the guys in the house. On all three shifts, that all that all made lieutenant, and oh. I didn't. Ha I I did well. I did well on the test, but I had I had to do time and rank, and time and rank I believe in. Time and rank is hugely important to be able to make the next step, and that was one of the greatest things Local Two ever did. I was not ready to be a lieutenant when I landed on that list. I needed to do four more years or five more years, whatever it took, until I got promoted. But long story short. There were seven openings, and I think the, if, if if I was the guy grading grading the <laughs> interviews, I was obviously seven out of seven. So there was <laughs> there was a lot of great people that went to the squad uh, during then. I only can remember the names on my shift. So Tommy in Missouri and uh, Sean T. Haynes, who is now the captain of Squad Five, were two guys that I went with on a second platoon to Squad Five with. And uh, those guys are those guys are my brothers, man. I love those two guys. They're both great guys, and I would do anything for them. And uh, there were other guys. By that time, Brian McCardle had already crossed the floor. Bobby Smith had crossed the floor. He was on the squad before me. Uh, Joe Atkins was there, Terry O'Donnell, Will Trezik, and Billy Nolan was the captain of the squad. And then shortly after that, Billy Nolan retired, and uh, Eric Strong became the captain, first African-American captain of, of Squad 5. Derek Strong is there now as a fireman, and Derek is a really smart guy from Truck 20 who's an attorney and... He was in the JAG Corps at, uh, in the Army. Just a great kid. So how long were you on the squad then? Um, three or four years before I got promoted to lieutenant. And you had to leave the squad once you got promoted? Yep, and I relieved as a lieutenant uh, in the loop. I went downtown with Deputy, D Deputy District Chief Tommy Casey, who's another that, – that's a legend <laughs> of the Casey family, relative of Kev's. Just a great man, prince of a man. Couldn't have been a better role model to learn from. And I made a bunch of mistakes downtown, so we'll, we'll talk about those, you know. Because <laughs> I was, I, I worked in Inglewood as a fireman pretty much it's my, a, it's a my whole career. It's different. a whole different operation, yeah. right? So a couple of the funny stories that, that if, if uh, Mike Murphy was still here, God rest his soul, a buddy of mine, he would tell you, I had a, an electrical vault in the loop, an above-ground electrical vault, which is a fire-resistive building, uh, probably... 20 by 40, heavy black smoke. I didn't know it was a fire resistive. Uh, I didn't know it was an electric fault. I came from 116, so I'm telling guys, drop two, two and a halfs, get a hydrant, we're good to go. It's an electrical vault. That was a mistake. Chief Casey <laughs> kind of coached me up on that. 
And then I actually got a guy hurt early in my career as a lieutenant. Dennis, I forget Dennis's last name. Dennis is either a lieutenant or a captain. And he was a candidate. And we had a basement fire uh, in a high-rise sub-basement. And it was like white, chintzy smoke. It was not a big deal. Long story short, it was uh, electrical material burning in a computer. And we took a bit of a beating. And after about three or four breathing treatments from the ambulance, when we got back, we were fine. Because <laughs> we didn't have our masks on. You know, so... That was lesson learned at the time, too. But uh, as soon as I got my year in and uh, the loop, I went back to the south side, went back to the 5th District. You found the spot? No, never had a spot as a lieutenant. So Just relieved the whole time? You I relieved for eight years. Okay. Uh, the only time I had a spot is for the three years that I worked for Chief Fox as a training officer in special operations when I worked days. So that was your natural progression to special operations? Yeah, so I think if I remember correctly... Um, John Scheinflug was the training officer before me, the plug and plug went back to the company and he was a fireman on squad one and they were looking for a guy. And I was like, this might be pretty cool. I might want to try this. And, uh, you know, uh, I was a fireman on squad five. I'm interested in getting some more training. I didn't have all the training at the time. And, uh, I had been going to school during that whole time. I went to graduate school in Oklahoma state with another good buddy of mine, Danny Ellis, I, and if anybody's listening and they're on the fire department and you're not using that tuition reimbursement clause that the contract uh, allows you to do, please use it. You know, give yourself a, a plan B so that if your back goes out or if you get hurt or, God forbid, you go off the job, you have something to fall back on. Danny Ellis and I went to grad, uh, undergrad at SIU, like a lot of guys and girls do. And then Oklahoma State was offering a, a master's in fire and emergency management. And they were recruiting guys from SIU and they pretty much paid the full ticket for us to go down there. So wow. my okay. boy, my boys were young at the time and my wife was like, yeah, you should go get your graduate degree. I was like, <laughs> see you in three weeks. So we used to go down for three weeks in May and three weeks in July on campus. And I think it took me five years. It took Danny Ellis four years. But um, yeah, so I wanted to try that and see how it worked out. And it was a great opportunity. Mike Fox was another great guy that I worked for, tough man. Old school, his dad was on a job. He would never give you an IR number, but he would MF you, you know, like he was your son. And then two minutes after he got mad at you, it was over with. So uh, probably one of the smartest guys I ever worked for. He was a voracious reader. He read about technical rescues from all over the world and had a really good knowledge. And that, that was right after 9-11 that I took that job, right after New York. And then all this money started to flow in for training and for tools. And he was really smart about it, and he purchased a lot of tools that um, we thought were viable for a large-scale disaster that, knock wood, we've never had to use here in the city of Chicago. But he pretty much set the table for training and uh, tools uh, and setting up all the specialized rigs, the dive team, um, the helicopters as we know them now, uh, the hazmat team along with Chief Eversall, and then the squad companies and then the collapse companies as we know. Well, um, let's uh, let's jump ahead to, since you were talking about collapse. Um, it was uh, two years ago, right? In August when August we had that, uh, the water plant. Collapse. Yeah, it was uh, Commissioner Santiago's last day. Oh, was it really? Yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah, we all missed his party. <laughs> we all missed his party at headquarters because we were too busy at that other run. Yeah, so, yeah August it was, uh, 2019, probably, uh, maybe not your, uh, I mean, you were talking about like maybe not the most famous incident you've had, but probably from, from our research, probably the most well-documented. Yeah, really well, really well, really well documented. So it was a big media event because it was during the daytime and I think it was on a Friday and it was a nice day. So you know how the media is. The media likes to be out when it's nice, but it was a, um, ended up being an explosion from sewer gas, uh, at a water wreck building. It was a it's full all concrete, right? Yep. Fire resistive, full pancake collapse with 10 uh, iron workers trapped in the building. Chris Lyons was the first chief on the scene with uh, members of the 22nd Battalion who did a yeoman's job there. Chris was smart enough, young in his career, to take building collapse training like a lot of chief officers were. Well, that's what I, 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 I want to make sure that, that we cover because when you look at what actually happened at that um, water plant, 
you guys at IFSI set up almost the exact, if you look at them side by side, you'd almost be like, this is the exact same structure that you guys have been training on. Purely by luck. I wish yeah. I, I would love to tell you here, center events, you know, <laughs> that's the way we planned it. That's what we're thinking right. about. But IFSI had a, and that's the job that I have now, had a huge role in my career, both as a young firefighter and as a chief officer and a company officer and taking classes and learning from guys from all over the world. That's the benefit of something that's in our backyard that I don't think a lot of people on this job take advantage of. All the classes the city officers offers that come out from the Special Operations Division uh, in the fall time, which single role medics can now take because I got well, that because done. Because of you. I got that done so before I retired. Thank you very much. Hey, that was Chief Sampy and Chief Ford that were able to help me get that yeah. done. That was not just me. That was a team effort. Um, because so let, let's reiterate let's, Explain to people what exactly that you did for them so that, you know, we wasn't me. Well, Nothing that I do is, it was I, done by me. It was all, I always, listen, and I, I mean no bullshit by this. Everything that I had a hand in, somebody helped me do. Right. Everything, my whole career, my family life, uh, growing up, it was a we, t a we thing. It was not an I thing ever. I, and I understand that. But um, I, I do think that, without you leading the charge there, this wouldn't have gotten done. Well, um, I think it, it's just a, it's a natural progression. We're crossing over young guys uh, at, a, at a faster rate now than we ever have before. I don't think that the grant funding for the classes because they're free, that's the biggest thing. So there's fire departments that spend money out of their budget to send people to these classes. Where in Chicago, we spend zero. They're all grant funded classes. And, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Michelle Cullerton Conforti, who is the Assistant Commissioner of Homeland Security for the Fire Department. Vince knows her. He had a meeting with her. She's lights out, man. She handles all the grant work for us, and she makes sure that uh, those classes are encompassed in the grant uh, money so that we can send people to school there. And I couldn't do, uh, and neither could Chief Fox, because Chief Fox worked with her, worked with her as well, we couldn't provide the classes that we provide every year for free without their help. And the sad thing for me is those classes don't all fill up. Yeah. Right? Right. So it's not uncommon. <laughs> Corey will fix it. You guys yeah, I have to fix that for me. <laughs> well, it's not uncommon for us to have to cancel a class on, a, on occasion because we can't get anybody to go. And I understand family commitments and raising a family and side jobs and all that. But you definitely set the table so that single role paramedics can take these classes that they couldn't have taken previously. Well, part of the reason we were able to offer, to be very honest with you, was we weren't filling the classes. And I was like, why aren't we offering these classes to everybody on the job? Let's fill the classes while we have the money. Because there's going to be a point in time, and I would think probably in the next five years, that the feds are going to say, yeah, we're not paying for that. G give us an example hey, of well, the classes that a, a single role can now attend that well, he could attend. Right? Well, they have to get rope operations first. Rope operations is the baseline class uh, that's provided by uh, the Illinois Fire Service Institute that leads into all the other classes. And then there's rope technician, trench operations, trench, te trench technician, confined space operations, confined space technician, uh, building collapse operations, building collapse technician. Some of the requirements for some of the other classes require a firefighter certification. Those ones do not. I don't believe I don't have the list in front of me, but I know rope, rope operations doesn't, right? Yeah. And most of the other ones do not as well. You might not be able to get the, st the state cert, but you can at least take the class and get certified in that discipline, and that crosses over. Especially if you're going to be crossing over in the next five years, yeah, you should be jumping on any free training you can get because you never know when you're going to be the first do company like uh, Truck Twenty Seven was, and a lot of those guys were trained from Truck Twenty Seven. Truck 27 probably made five or six rescues that day at the water wreck plant before anybody from special operations got there under the tutelage of Chris Lyons because Chris had taken all those classes as a, as a young company officer and as a chief officer, and they knew what to do. So how fire departments across the country now are, are all hazards departments, right? We get called for everything. Right. Swift water, tech rescue, hazmat, terrorism. So if you're going to be on the job and you're young, like this young man over here, you should be jumping on everything that you can get for free. And that's the way um, that we approached it back in the day when we were first paying for classes. A lot of guys had to pay for classes out of their pocket. 
And then after 9-11, the money came through to get those classes for free. Yeah, I mean, something that, um, something that I always kind of try and hold on to myself and, and push around on occasion is like, I just feel like every year if you benefit yourself by taking some type of class. Even if you just do one. Just one. Yeah, it, it, all it takes is one because, you know, and let's be honest, in, in a 40-hour class, which is one of the shorter ones, in a 40-hour class, if you learn one thing, you know, because we, uh, just like just like all of us do, we got short attention spans. That's why you guys are pretty good about breaking up breaks all the time. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, like, it, it, if you learn one thing, it's going to make you better that next time. And and there's just no reason to 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 say that you can't. I'm, I won't humble brag too much, but like if if I if I'm gonna humble brag about anything, is that I got about seventeen thousand side jobs, including this right here. <laughs> yeah, everybody and, does, you know, right? If you, you can't do you find gotta... one week, you know, that works with your schedule at the fire department, you know, uh, you gotta be able to make some make some sacrifice to get some type of uh, forward progression. There's another guy that was a mentor of mine that came, that crossed over with me, but had time as a single role paramedic before me, Mitch Crooker, who's the chief of the 19th Battalion. And I think Mitch is retiring this year. He is says he, really? he says he is, okay. but <laughs> well, I, I'll believe it when I see him walk yeah. out the door and turn his stuff. In. <laughs> but long story short, Mitch wanted to be a special operations chief. Mitch took all those classes, every one that I just told you, all eight plus nine writ, nine classes. He got them all done in a year, all of them. The classes just flowed for him, and he was able to get them all done so that he could relieve in the special ops buggy because he thought it was valuable to him as a chief officer to be able to have that training that the city was sending him to. He's a perfect example. And here's a guy that's towards the tail end of his career, right, jumping on those classes and happy to be there and engaged and, and doing what he's supposed to be doing. And Mitch is, Mitch is nuts. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> right? I love the guy. But here's a guy, you know, he's probably got 30, 35 years on a job, and he's taking classes that's encouraging, I think, uh, for anybody on the job. Yeah, you know, and as, as a student in these classes, I can't tell you how many times I've taken a class where, you know, maybe it's just me from my department, or maybe it's me and a couple other guys. Maybe there's a bunch of other guys from similar size departments as mine, or maybe there's there's a primarily, say, a Chicago guy's crew, and, like, just from five years on the job up to, 35 years on the job right. like everyone's a student there everyone is is helping out yeah there's it, no rank structure no, it, no it's 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 huge it's it's great even just the networking to talk to i mean i would i would have never met you if it wasn't for that stuff yeah. you know yeah. it's, I, I, it's had a huge role in and what i believe and who i've met and talked to firefighters from all over the country and see what they have to go through to get the same training that's offered here yeah. and so let's let's blow some smoke up local two's ass for a minute, right? Let's so, do it. right. So if you go out and look at what firefighters and paramedics, even single role paramedics, are paid across the country, and I would challenge anybody after this airs, go tell me where you're going to make more money and receive the benefits that you have now as a Chicago firefighter, as a Chicago fire paramedic. There's not many for right? working roughly eighty six days a year. Yeah, there's not many. I looked. I looked my whole career. I said, there's got to be greener pastures out there. There is not greener pastures out there. We are well represented by that union. Jimmy Tracy just won re-election and Mark Egan uh, for secretary treasurer. And uh, I'm not being political here. I'm not telling you who I voted for. But, you know, those guys, that's a tough job, man. And, and, and it's going to be tough for these guys again now uh, with the city, city dealing with uh, loss of revenue. And uh, the problem that we have now with any department, I think, and we can get in this a little bit because this is where the, the rubber meets the road, is you have bureaucrats and politicians who think they're emergency response professionals that have no background. But the, the, the flavor of the month is I should be able to speak about anything topical because I'm the leader of this city, I'm the leader of this branch of government, and they get their information usually from people that work and the budget department, whose job it is to cut the budget, that's what they get paid for. They don't get paid to in, to increase the budget, right? They're doing a good day's work if they can figure out how to save the city a million dollars. And that's their job, and you can't hold that against them. But you have to explain to them what budget cuts entail. Do you live in the city? Your parents are going to be affected. 
And uh, I think that the difference between some administrations and administrations that we might have now is the ability to say that. You know, if you cut the helicopters, for instance, which may have happened when I was in <laughs> special operations, these are the people whose lives were saved in the last 10 years by the helicopter dive crews. Uh, these are the children that are alive. These are the adults that are alive. And, you know, I'm nearing retirement. I might stand up and say at a press conference that the helicopters were cut by you and this person died because of you. You know, what are you willing to do? Are you willing to be part of the team? Do you think that the fire service, uh, firefighters and paramedics are an essential service? in the country that we live in, in a big metropolitan city like the city of Chicago? I do. I think it's essential service. And, and the level of service that we have now is very, very good, and I don't think it should ever be cut. Uh, runs continue to go up. People continue to die in fires. We need uh, paramedics on companies to address issues that ambulance can't, can't get to, and we need more ambulances. You know, I think if we get up near 100, it still might not be enough because there has to be some... Uh, education to the public as to what we can respond to and what we can't respond to. Uh, but those are conversations that politicians and bureaucrats don't like to have. They feel that they're, they're able to speak on the issue. And, and in my opinion, most times they're not. Well, what, um, it's, it's yeah. hard to argue calculated losses when we're people that are, holding a five-year-old's hand who got hit by a car right or you know the the grandmother who um you know the grandmothers who, who were showing up for their 15th time of their exacerbation of congestive heart failure you know it's hard to it, it's hard for us to not get emotional when we're talking about these people and and to uh, to some politicians there it's it's a calculated risk it's a number on a on a dashboard and it's it's you know it doesn't mean as much to a lot of a lot of other people as it does to us because we were there we're we're invested well here's the other thing Court. we're the only city service no matter what city you're from <laughs> where people pick up the phone and they call us and they, and they say hey we need help right and what's the answer no matter where you work we'll be, be right there. there we'll be there yeah. we'll be right there it's, it's it's on the side of our rigs Right. It's on the, it, yeah, it's on the side of our rigs. It's on the side of our rigs. But that's the only city service that's left. I mean, it takes six months to get a tree trimmed, right, <laughs> or to get a new garbage can. Yeah. And But the fire department answers calls both on the EMS side, the inspectional side, uh, and the fire side every day for citizens that request help. They don't ask where, they don't ask who you are. They ask your address, your phone number, and what your problem is. Yeah. And I think we're definitely moving towards a time. I think it's going to be hard for Local 2 to negotiate this next contract. The mayor has been stand up and has said that there's not going to be any cuts in public safety. But Mayor de Blasio was uh, on the news yesterday saying, yeah, there's cuts. There's going to be cuts in public safety. And he's not a friend of the fire and police department there uh, at all. Out in New York. Uh, and hopefully Mayor Lightfoot, who I don't always agree with, I work for. Um, you know, sometimes I'm a fan, sometimes I'm not, that's for sure. Hopefully she is a woman of her word and she takes care of police and fire because our brothers in blue are our right arm, our brothers and sisters in blue, and they need to be taken care of as well. And nobody's looking to make a million dollars on this job. No. They're looking to get off the job, make a, a decent wage to be able to send their kids to a decent school, raise their family, and collect a pension. And, well, yeah, and not die inside six months after leaving their yeah, job. Yeah, right. Well, Kevin Casey said it best uh, when he was on here. He said... We don't need a new truck. We need tires for our truck, you know, and if the cost of milk and bread go up, you know, change our wage accordingly. Right. You know, and, and if you can't, we're still going to be there no matter what. Yeah. And, and that's kind of the nature of our job is that we're no matter what, what issues that we've ever had with contracts and, and, um, contracts and, and uh, benefits and stuff like we're, Rarely have we ever not been there because of that. You know, we're, we're always showing up. We're still coming to work. You know, we're, we're still we're doing what we more. have to do every day. We do more now than we ever have. Right. I mean, I was sending guys to South Bend, Indiana for the last five years so they could be swift water trained. We're a metropolitan fire department. We have a small amount of swift water in our city, you know, but there's 300 guys on the Chicago Fire Department that are swift water trained to the level two standard that have been deployed 
down to the Mississippi River in southern Illinois to make rescues uh, because other fire departments can't afford to take that training and don't have the money or the guys to get that done. And now the fire department has under uh, Jason Locke's command and Chief Stampy's command, you know, six, four or six swift water boats and the ability to make swift water rescues. So they just keep piling more shit on the fire department. <laughs> they, they do, man. They right. do. They keep, oh, yeah, the fire department will take care of that. T cutting down trees after a storm? Ah, the, fire, the forestry, those guys aren't working at home, right? The only city agency that's on duty all the time, available with manpower, person power, <laughs> don't, don't don't yell at me, ladies. Um, is the fire department? So we're the go-to agency, and the answer is always always yes, always yes. Right. There's never been a time where we say we're not going to go, and we always do. Yeah. So we'll we show up. There's a problem. We're like, eh. Yeah. Speaking, of, what is what would you say is you, thirty-three years? Yep. In your thirty-three years, what is the most memorable thing that you've done on the fire department? Ooh. That's a really good question. I didn't expect that one. Oh, it was coming. I got it written down right here. Uh, I would say setting the table for the guys behind me to um, show them that you can be, uh, have some humility, be a chief officer, uh, but take care of the people that you work for, which uh, that was the way it was taught to me. Just because you have rank doesn't mean we talked about a few minutes ago. It doesn't mean anything. You're, the only job that you have when you have rank is that you have more people to take care of. And I think you and I and Corey as well and you as well, we could pick out 10 people that have had an impact on our career by the way they treated people. And this job is a person job, right? Male, female, you work with people. If you don't like people, you don't belong in this job because you deal with the citizenry, who's obviously people, and the people you work with every day. So if you can't support the people that you work with to do a better job, both in manpower and tools, equipment and training, as you move up the rank structure, then why are you here? You're just a paycheck and you're just taking up a space that a broomstick could take. Yeah. It's time to go away. So I can't take credit for any of that because that's the way I was raised. And we talked about that before, right? That's how you're raised on this job, which which makes you, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not a yes man. There's probably people that'll listen to this and say Walsh is an asshole. And that's okay, because well, you can't be friends with everybody. I can tell you that's exactly why I liked doing some special events with you. Yeah. Because um, uh, I knew something, you know, needed to be done. I'd go right to you. You know, in most of the instances that I work with you, you kind of just looked at me and said, if you think that's right, do it. Yeah, and that's you know? a huge that's a great point. I'm glad that you brought that up. So I don't I never felt like I had all the answers. When you feel like you have all the answers, that's another issue. Your job is to make decisions, but you should get input from everybody from the newest candidate on the street if it's appropriate, right? I'm not saying that you're going to go to him or her and ask him if you need to pull a 211, but everybody has a little bit of input. There's not anything too crazy that has to be decided right now. So I, there were many times I had all these great, when I made deputy district chief, I had all these great senior chief officers that were battalion chiefs. When I was probably a battalion chief with two years on a job, they had been battalion chiefs six, seven, eight years. Louis Bongiorno, uh, Marco Siniak, Larry Kane, Ace Bigot, um, Mitch Crooker, you know, so I used to talk with these guys and say, hey, am I, you know, am I fucking this up? How should I do this? How should we approach this? You have to get input from everybody that you work with, company officers, lieutenants, paramedic officers, engineers, to say, hey, what's going on here? Am I missing something? That was always my favorite question. What are we missing? What did I forget? There's got to be something we're not talking about. And then once that decision is made and you have a conversation about it, because there's sometimes on the fire ground or an emergency incident where you don't have time to do that. But when you have time to do that, Everybody buys in on it, right? Everybody's voice is heard. You might not agree with the voices that you heard, but at least it gives you another view. Yeah, and it's pers perspective. Yeah, right. Yeah. One right. of, uh, I was talking to an old, uh, not old, but but an older, uh, uh, recently promoted captain, and uh, or promoted from captain, and um, he was talking about one of his first bigger incidents that we had in, uh, in our town where there was a high-rise fire. And he had been a captain for a couple of years, and he had gotten this high-rise fire. 
and um, and he's like, you know, I'd been so used to dealing with incident response at a certain level, and when after dealing with a couple of these bigger incidents that he had had, he's like, you, you know, one of the biggest obstacles to overcome is putting a a key, putting a guy in a key position and letting them run with it. And, you know, you're, once you start to, to micromanage and then that's when you get into trouble, but yeah. putting, you know, having a guy like Vince doing, you know, handling this particular aspect of the incident is, you know, knowing that you trust, trust that guy and, and allowing him to run, what else can you do? Yeah, that's huge. That's a really good point, Corey. <clears throat> I mean, I ever, never was a big believer in micromanaging. Yeah. You know, I used to talk to the guys that with me and my coworkers, I should say, the lieutenants and the captains and the chiefs, and I'd be like, what do you guys need? Right. What do you need me to do? What obstacles can I get out of your way so that you can get your job done? And uh, I know for me as a company officer and as a paramedic officer and as a paramedic, that was always refreshing to hear somebody say that. You mean I can do whatever I want? I just have to get the task done? And everybody on this job is type A. Yeah, there's some type B slugs, but pretty much everybody in the fire service is type A. They all want to get shit done all the time, right? right? Get it done, get it done, get it done, get it done. So, yeah, your job is to support people the further you go up the chain, not be not be obstinate, not get in their way. And to do that, you have to – the bugles don't mean shit, man. What was What was your biggest fire? I was just talking about the other day as a chief, I don't really remember, but as a lieutenant, I was uh, on Tower Ladder 39 with Mike Cummings, and we were on a variance, and it was the 511 with two specials at 630 South Wabash. And the two guys that were detailed to us, and Mike had all, Mike was the only assigned guy on Tower Ladder 39. He was the driver. Um, the two firemen that we had with us from another company were afraid of heights, <laughs> and we had to go take the basket all the way up to the top of the building, and... Uh, we were there for a long time. They wouldn't go in the basket, so I had to go up with Mike to help put the fire up. That was the biggest, like, actual fire as a company officer or as a chief officer. Well, probably like a 211 or a 311, but I don't know. There's a lot of them. I don't even None really... of these big events, like historical big events that you uh, that you had to manage? No, Bobby Hoff will get mad at me because that guy, he's like, you guys, that's a guy you guys got to. We're trying. You're we're trying. trying. Yeah. I'll, I'll reach out to him after I'm done yeah. here. That's a guy that I, uh, that was a mentor to me that can remember dates, times, what he had for dinner, who was on the company with him when he went to a fire. He's ridiculous. <laughs> ridiculous. And that's when he's drinking too. Right? <laughs> so, I mean, it's just the guy, he's like a, a, a living, a living encyclopedia, encyclopedia. Britannica. And for the young guys, that was like before Google. You actually had to look shit up. <laughs> right, you remember that? Yeah. Every year you bought it. You bought the set. <laughs> yeah, every year you bought a remember set. Remember the salesman that came up? <laughs> yeah, but uh, uh, the building collapse was uh, pretty kind of a big deal. Um, well, let's get back to that because, uh, you know, like I said, that training facility that you have for collapse, which, you know, I know that you, you were, that's one of your, your classes that you do. Yeah. Um, but the people who showed up, to um, uh, mitigate that that collapse at the uh, water plant, yeah, all those guys had gone through that that all, class, right? All, you, all of them had gone through the class, and like five or six of them were instructors that I worked with <laughs> down there on a daily so, basis. Oh my. So, so that, we that had one a, guy that you guys saved couldn't have gotten hurt on a better day. It was a perfect a perfect storm. Yeah. It's the ninety two dream team yeah. shows up. Well, I don't know. I mean I'm five six. You're looking right at me, Corey. I'm five six, two hundred pounds. Dream team and, and Walsh are not uh, a common phrase around the Walsh household, that's for sure. But I mean I had Tommy Missouri who's a captain in Uptown. I had Corey Hojack who's a lieutenant on squad five. Pat Finn who's a firefighter paramedic uh, on uh, squad five and a half a dozen other guys that were all Jimmy Pearl was there, who's the chief of special op, battalion chief of special operations. Chris Lyons, who took the class, a couple of guys tossed him from truck twenty seven and sixty two's quarters. It, it, you know, we got lucky. You know, I'd rather be lucky than good. So yeah, we were yeah. really lucky that day that we had all trained together, we had all taken the same class, we had all done the same uh, evolution together, the bridge beam evolution. And actually, that run is going to be in fire engineering uh, next month. Okay. We did a cover story, and Gordy Nord, who follows guys around and gets great pictures, Gordy Nord did the pictures for us, and it's supposedly going to be a cover picture. So it, it just wow. goes back to your training. I mean, you never think that when you're lifting, a, you know, a uh, 
70 foot bridge beam down at U of I in Champaign on a, on a two o'clock on a Thursday afternoon off a car to pretend that you're rescuing somebody out of a car with four dummies in it, that you're ever going to use it in your career. Mannequins. Well, yeah, mannequins. Oh. Yeah. Not, not real breathing dummies. Thank you for pointing that out to me. I did, you know, our guys. Yeah. But you never think that that's going to have an impact on you. But it does, right? So. Um, one thing. One thing yeah, one, one place. Yeah, just one time, right place, right, pla- right, right time, right place. And, and that man, who I think his sister was the campaign manager for, the media campaign manager for the mayor. Lightfoot. So you guys should use that card when you come in negotiations. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, he was a nice man and Steve, he was, what, he was lucky Steve to survive right now. Well, so he, he was actually pinned in there. Everybody else, they got out right away. There was two guys pinned, uh, one lightly pinned that truck 27 and, and chief lions rescued right away and squad five. And then we didn't even know where this other gentleman was. And uh, Chris Lyons and I, Went and found the plant manager. He was brought to us. And we said, where where was the last guy working? Because there was, you know how a building yeah, collapses what, what was, in the fire department. What were the dimensions of this to give people some perspective on? So the building itself, if there. I remember correctly, was probably about uh, 70 feet deep by 125 wide, fire-resistive concrete tilt-up construction. And the explosion was so monumental that the the exterior walls of the building blew out and the roof, which was concrete, came down and pinned everything that was underneath it, including the members that were about 10 iron workers that were working in the building. It's amazing that, that nobody got killed in this. Unbelievable. I right? mean, it's almost like, how is that possible? Unbelievable. When you what see how this, this? Sewer uh, gas. Sewer gas. So they used a torch to, uh, I don't know who specifically did it, but there was an investigation done by a company called uh, Wiss Janey, who was a forensic building. Uh, engineering Engineers. firm that uh, looked at the explosion and uh, they determined that the, a torch that was used to get some screws off a door, some bolts, which is what caused the explosion because they weren't monitoring appropriately at the time. So um, we didn't know how many people were lost. We knew a bunch. We didn't have strict accountability of who was missing. And you know how the fire department is, man. There was guys everywhere when we first <laughs> got there. They were like ants on a molehill you know, looking for people. Didn't you get there and clear everybody out? We did. Yeah. Chris and I cleared everybody out right away and tried to get uh, a better accountability of where people were. We knew we had the one gentleman pinned on the A side and then the other gentleman we were able to find just from what our training was. And it goes back to our training. So we asked the foreman, Hey, where was he working? Take us to where you last saw him. And we went back there and we called the guy's name and he answered us. That's how we found him. Yeah. I mean, if we had to go through that whole building by hand to find him, we would have needed a crane, and he would have passed away if he was unconscious. But for the grace of God, he was awake, he was alert, he was oriented. I don't know if he was oriented, but he, he knew his name. He had a couple of fractures to his leg. Oh, his legs were pinned bef- like below a jersey barrier. Imagine oh. an upside-down jersey barrier that's 70 feet long. That's what his legs were pinned by. Jeez. So uh, Corey Hojak and Tommy Missouri, who were the company officers on Squad 1 and Squad 5 that day, crawled in there and devised a plan with uh, Chief Jimmy Pearl uh, in support, getting cribbing in there. And then all the other guys were working to crib up the building that were surrounding it. And they lifted it with airbags, just like we did down in Champaign. And then Pat Finn crawled in there and did his paramagic stuff <laughs> and put an IV in the guy and gave him bicarb. We were talking to USC the whole time. And then... So, yeah, I wanted to ask you that. So, um, was that something that you called into the hospital prior to doing saying, Hey, we got a guy pinned. We want to, um, try to stay ahead of this rhabdo. Um, and you know, kind of, cause if I was to do that, I would want to be on the phone with, I called him on my city cell phone, nine, four, seven, seven, four, two, three. That is the telemetry <laughs> number for the university of Chicago hospital. I remember it. Yeah. I would probably, be saying it on my deathbed right before I take my last bowl of tapioca, right? So I know that number because when cell phones came out, we used to call them on a cell phone all the time. We would not use the radio. So I called there and Sid Gajewski, Carl Ostrowski's wife, is who I was talking to. That's who who answered the radio. And I was like, Sid, we got this guy pinned. He's underneath a beam. I'm afraid when we raise this beam that we're either going to have to amputate his legs or he's going to crap out. So how much bicarb do we give him? We got an IV in him. 
and she just had us give bicarb in the bag, and we gave him bicarb. I think two amps of bicarb by the time we got him unpinned, and then we started the helicopter in because there was plenty of room for him to land out at 130th Indiana, and what's not to like about having a paramedic or a, a doctor and a nurse come in and and and, and take care of your patient after you turf yeah. them off? Because um, you know, you could have all the technical rescue stuff there, but if you can't take care of that guy that you're going in there for, um, you know, you're kind of missing the point. Yeah, I, I, I mean, some guys will, will get mad at me for saying this, but having Pat Finn there, and uh, I'm still a paramedic. I, my car doesn't go uh, not good for three more years. To be able to discuss how we wanted to take care of that guy and make a call, and then I had uh, another paramedic on squad one, so they were taking turns crawling in there and taking care of that guy, putting him on oxygen, getting an IV in him while the other guys were working on extricating him. That's the way we should be operating. That's what we all train for, and there's nothing wrong with that. That guy like countless other people in the city that are cared for every day by crossover medics or single role medics that are still walking God's green earth um, are lucky to have the type of people that work for this department taking care of them, you know? Well, it, you know, uh, we've covered uh, um, that kind of special operation uh, part of your career. Now, you're doing something kind of unique and – did this come about because of the whole COVID thing where you're doing the Facebook Live and you're doing the training? Is, yeah. is that just out of necessity? Because well, it was a little bit out of necessity. We didn't really know what direction we wanted to go in down at uh, the Institute, the Illinois Fire Service Institute. So there was an, uh, an obvious deliberate discussion and collaboration amongst the people that were down there is how do we deliver training to fire departments that are overwhelmed right now? And our first instinct was... COVID-19. They don't know anything about COVID-19. I don't know anything about COVID-19. How can we get them training on COVID-19 so that they can make uh, safe decisions on the street to protect the citizens, but mostly protect themselves and their families that they're going home to? So Bobby Hoff was a natural choice, man. Talk about a That was your very first one. That was our very first one. Talk about a guy, oh. you know, a, a, a port in a storm to pull up to a guy that's <laughs> been through uh, all kinds of stuff in his career. I mean, his father being killed in the line of duty and many line of duty deaths and being able to control emotion and be able to control uh, what's going on. He was our first choice to speak. And then Richie Stack is a company officer because not everybody in the fire service is familiar with how to deal with PPE and how to deal with uh, communicable disease. So that was a natural choice. And then we brought in... Uh, Putting guys in key positions. Yeah, right. You know? Right. So I was, I, I've been calling in a lot of favors, man. I was like, I know you don't want to do this. I know you don't want to be on camera. I got a face for radio too. That's why today was an easy yes. <laughs> right. I'm not a, I'm not a camera guy. Um, but yeah, uh, Jill Sauer in our marketing department department and uh, Colonel Roy, Mo Royal Mortensen and deputy director, Jim Keepkin and all the program directors and all the, there's 500 instructors down there. So we have a huge pool of people to draw from to be able to present free uh, topical training as to what's going on in the fire service and EMS service right Let now. Let people know how they can view these or the schedule or so that people can watch. Cause I've watched them so far <laughs> and I've probably learned, you know, more about just basic, you know, throwing ladders, opening roofs and stuff like that, that, you know, it, Everything is very basic. You're not doing like special yeah, no, stuff. We're it's not, just back to basic stuff. So after we got done with the COVID stuff, so we had uh, Chief Hoff, Richie Stack, uh, uh, Chris Downey, who's a hazmat guy that uh, handles hazmat at the Institute. Um, Katie, uh, the project medical director from USC, came in and talked about. Tataris. Uh, Katie Tataris talked about uh, EMS considerations. And then Jimmy Moore, who's our uh, associate director there, who's a retired uh, chief from Crystal Lake, he talked about the whole bringing this stuff home, which is huge for guys. I've had offline conversations with guys about what it's like to go home to your young children while you're dealing with this right. and how it affects you and affects your wife and affects your family life. It's huge stuff. So after we covered those six areas, we felt we've pr I, those are all six slices of the pie, you know, How's the fire department going to handle it? Company officer, EMS, um, counseling services that are available to you. Everything that was available to us, PPE for hazmat. So where are we going to go now? Let's just do basic firefighter stuff. And that's where we got into Jimmy Dignan and Tommy Missouri talking about throwing ladders. 
Uh, our biggest one to date was the other day with my buddies from Milwaukee, where my son's a firefighter paramedic and has some great mentors up there. Yeah, that's the one I, I just saw. Is that, that guy a chief? In, no, in that guy's a lieutenant. A officer, really? right. That guy's a lieutenant, yeah. Tommy McMiniman, one of the best guys going ever. Just a wealth of knowledge and a guy easy to talk to. It's easy to talk to in a bar or a radio show when you got a brandy, brandy <laughs> old fashioned in front of you, as he is on the fire ground. And then the two guys you work with, Jason Ross and Joe Koskovich, two stand-up guys. So my youngest son is a firefighter paramedic in Milwaukee. Great department, rich history. They really take great care of them up there, take no shit from them. Really a great place for a young kid to learn. And uh, I talked about my son, Kevin, who's an ER nurse at Mercy, and then my oldest son, uh, Brian's probably going to get on this job. He just got out of the Airborne. So he should be in the next call for the fire department. So, wow. you know, um, <clears throat> I yeah. can't stress enough that the training available there, even online, if you go to www.fsi.illinois.edu, it's the state's fire academy. So we have the Chicago Fire Academy here in the city of Chicago. And, Corey, where did you get your training at? I, I personally got my training up in Glenview. Yeah, but, yeah um, uh, but But ongoing training, you know, that was my basic firefighter training. After that, you know, uh, out in the suburbs, we explore wherever we can to, to get our state fire marshal certs. And, and IFSI has been a, a godsend for Yeah, us. we see 65,000 <clears> students a year. And most of the programs that we teach are grant-funded programs that are free. Yeah. And they've been able to, uh, through Kim White, who handles grants, uh, administration of grants, and Sherry Ellenberg and, and Beth in the finance division and the business office and Melanie, there's a ton of people there working on behalf of firefighters and paramedics all across the state of Illinois. And sometimes guys, they're like, hey, there's a lot of people up in that front office. You know, what are they doing? They're getting free money for free classes for firefighters and paramedics in the state of Illinois. So now my new gig that I took just recently in February is to go out and partner with private agencies, uh, people that build tools and equipment for the fire service, to, oh. to, be, oh. to be able to get them. Real, real, uh, real to be able to class get, act operation. We yeah, to be here. able to get them equipment and training, uh, hopefully at a reduced cost. So all the people that we deal with, for instance, Globe, MSA, Scott, they are all partners with, uh, I'll let go, Cor. Sure. I've yeah. already broken it twice. Um, you keep raising it higher. I'm gonna, I don't have much draft in that left, pal. Um, it's a big business. Yeah. Right? So the fire surf, have you ever, have you, either of you guys ever been to FDIC? No, I have not. It's a huge business, right? <laughs> the amount of money. I'm sorry. <laughs> What's going on over to, there? To be me. clear, I'll, I'll, it, we're not even one I'm, and a half. I'm going to sit on my hands. I, I'm not, <laughs> touch, oh, see, I didn't even touch it that time. But yeah, it's a huge business. So to be able to get some, uh, to try to, to create uh, corporate relationships for the Fire Service Institute to be able to provide a bigger service and a better service to firefighters, not only in the state of Illinois, you know, we deliver nationally and all over, uh, all over the country is a big deal. And it was kind of a nice progression for me. I'm still involved in the fire service a little bit, but I'm not getting out of bed going to 211s in the middle of the night. And uh, one of my favorite things to do when I had the duty was, and you'll laugh about this because I think I ran into you on more than one occasion, is when I would have the duty on the weekends, I would just get in the car and go for a ride. <laughs> and I would just I would just creep up on people, not to get them, not to jam them up, but just to, and I would say, and they wouldn't know what to do with me, right? Because a, a lot of the younger guys, they don't know me. You know, they well, you, have too many, you had too many bugles on. I, that was part of it. And I was always wearing a uniform because <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want anybody to, you know, to think that I wasn't, you know, breaking the rules. Sure. But uh, I would just sneak up on a, cup, a company on the west side or a couple companies and they'd be out there bullshitting. I'd be like, hey, how are you guys doing? Like, <laughs> what are you doing here? You're just out. What did, guys, we, what did we do? Yeah. No, you guys didn't do it. Did you guys eat dinner? And they, they'd look at me like, what did he just say? <laughs> I'm asking, did you guys go? Did you guys sneak back and get dinner? Yeah, we snuck back. We got dinner. Good. All right. You guys need anything? No, good. Get in the car. Go to the next hospital. <laughs> so I'd start a little company by my house. We lived in Beverly. And then I'd usually end up like at West Sub or Loretto, uh, work my way north, and then I'd head my head home after that. Just bebopping around. Yeah, just bebopping around. I, um, just shaking hands and kissing babies, making sure everybody <laughs> was having a good day, you know? I, and 
Well, that's a freak out moment. You got a guy like Tim Walsh showing up, you know, and you're it's like, all oh, bullshit, man. though, right? Right. So the yeah. the Pope shits on a toilet. So does the president, <laughs> and so do I. And I don't have to bend down as far as most guys because I'm way shorter, <laughs> right? But, but that's not a normal it, thing in our job for somebody with that many bugles on to come up and be like, "How you guys doing? What's going on?" You know. So I really, uh, I'll tell you one more really good story about that. So Memorial Day, and it's kind of a sad. It's kind of a kind of a sad story so memorial day weekend a couple years ago i had the duty and it was a hot memorial day and i knew i was going to get called out and i did there was nonsense going on down at Earth avenue beach and jonathan saints was the assistant deputy chief paramedic down there and we ended up selling a, a couple als engines and uh, maybe two or three ambulances and a bike team and a cart team well we all got sucked there at dinner time right and i didn't want to be there any more than anybody wanted to be there so I was looking on my phone to see which restaurants were open, right? And there wasn't a lot of choices on a Memorial Day, but Panera was open. <laughs> so I called Panera, and I was like, they're like, yeah, what can we do for you? I was like, hey, this is the fire department we want to order. I said, how many sandwiches can you make? And they said, well, how many do you need? I said, well, I got about 50 people here I need. Why don't you give me 75 sandwiches with sides? You guys just figure it out, divide it up, whatever you want to do. And uh, so they're like, okay, who's going to pick it up? I said, I'll send a guy over to pick it up. Don't worry about that. So I called Jonathan over. I was like, hey, I need you to do me a favor. He's like, what? So you got to go to Panera over on Wells <laughs> and pick up a couple of boxes of food. Now, here's a guy that's a, right. he's kind of working with me to help run the scene there because we had a bunch of nonsense going on. He's like, you want me to go get sandwiches? I was like, yeah, dude. <laughs> These guys are all hungry. Go get sandwiches for them. They need to eat. I said, I'm telling you, every, look at everybody. I go, they're miserable. I'm miserable. You're miserable. Go get them a sandwich and a bag of chips. We got How nice of would, a, would, would a Panera Panini be right. right now? You know? said, That's even, all I'm saying. I don't even care what <laughs> they give us. Just go get us some food and come on back, and everything will be fine for the rest of the day. Unfortunately, that was the day that uh, Juan Busio died. So about an hour after we ate, we ate dinner, and we were out there, and we were starting to pick up companies. That's when uh, Juan Busio had a heart attack uh, in the south branch of the river and passed away, and that was another defining moment in my career that I don't wish enough upon anybody to have to go through a duty death like that. It was horrible. Was that the whole incident that you guys were, were doing out there? Um, no, that uh, the incident on North Avenue Beach was unrelated to the incident oh. on uh, the river. We were just there because there was game bangers acting up and causing problems on the beach, and they wanted a, a, an EMS presence there. Well, I, that whole incident of the gang bangers being out there is kind of what it instituted the bike team starting back up. Yep. Because – the mayor wanted the police department to have a presence there. And, you know, we decided, um, and when I say we, the fire department um, said, well, if the police are going to be out there, we can't not put a team out there. So that's when we got a cart team and a bike team back. And then we kind of expanded from there. Yeah. And how did, how did the bike team, how's the bike team looking for this year? What's it look like? I mean, I'm not involved. <laughs> it's, we are, uh, the official statement of the mobile medical response team is we're on hold. Oh, because uh, of COVID? There, yeah, there's there's nobody downtown. I don't know if you've yeah. driven downtown, but it's a ghost town. Well, I came from Shorewood today, and it took me 45 minutes. So, yes, there's nobody in the city. That's it, usually a two-hour ride. We have nobody downtown, which is where, you know, the busy bike teams patrol. There's obviously nobody at, you know, the beaches. And I can't perceive any special events going on under the current climate. So no, I agree. What, what's the bike team going to do? Unless I can figure a way to, you know, kind of fold the bike team into some kind of COVID response no, on, I th on wheels. I, you know, I think it'll probably open up for business maybe late summer and then you guys will be stood up again. Yeah. But I, it's a huge, really the only special response unit that there was when I was on the Amos was the- Did you ever go out for the bike team? Was it, it wasn't available. No? There was nothing cool like that, no. dude. It was like, if you got a day off Amos 24 and got to go to 27, that was your that was your home. <laughs> that run. was the big event. <laughs> that was the big event for the day, right? And everybody was trying to get there because every every place was busy. Now, but, now um, the big event is to see Vince in bike shorts. <laughs> well, I, I used to see him all the time because our guys would work with him all the time on water rescues, and that's how we first became friends. Yeah, well, right. Well, Just we, doing we, special special yeah. events and uh, special responses down on the lakefront. Well, we you know uh, I I picked your brain uh, about. Um, so last year I got to be the, like my oh. title was liaison for the bike team. Yeah. And so, uh, we had, uh, training for that year and it was training, which, you know, uh, I'm just going to admit what I did. Um, 
I uh, jumped in the water and these guys had to throw throw bags to me. Yeah, and that's great stuff because you, know? you guys uh, are usually first on the scene and Chief Doorknocker before Chief Lack trained with you guys and Ronnie's one of my favorite guys and so is Jason. I mean, that's huge responsibility for those guys as chief officers down there and huge responsibilities for the bike and car team because yeah, well, you guys are Johnny on the spot. Well, so. we, uh, you know, I was asking you about, you know, uh, you had some great advice about how to go about like tracking that training and doing all that. And, you know, we brought the, the sim lab out to the beach and those guys at the sim lab, I kind of said, hey, come up with the scenario, do whatever you want. Um, you know, as long as my guys, you know, I want them to um, work on, you know, applying a tourniquet and then the transition from the bikes to the cart to the ambulance. Right. Have them work on that transition so that's so that is seamless when an actual event happens. And uh, those guys from the sim lab, that was when the, remember when the alligator was in the lagoon? Yep. So the scenario at North Avenue Beach was the alligator bit somebody's arm off. We had, you know, uh, amputation. And then he goes into a cardiac arrest in the back of the sim lab. So, um, you know, it was all this uh, really cool stuff. But, you know, they go through their training prior to being on the bike team. And, um, you know, it just uh, coincidentally, uh, all the training that they do um, prior to getting on the bike team is all stuff that we've kind of pulled together from past incidents that we've had um, on actual runs from the bikes before because it's a very different um, program on the bikes you know you you kind of have to take most people out of paramedic mode or out of ambulance mode now that you're on a bike it's it's very different it's about the best of both worlds i think you could be able to get to treat and you turf off the patient as soon as you're done there's no Absolutely. there's no downside no it's right? it's a great day and you know uh, most likely it's it's a nice day um and it's one of the the only opportunities for uh um, single role paramedics to wear shorts and, you know, put on a short sleeve shirt and go ride around on a bike on a beautiful day. Well, I think one of the last times you and I worked together when you were running the bike team was Taste of Chicago last summer. Was it, oh, it, was it the Taste? Yeah, it was the Taste, yeah. It's the Taste. So we were together for, I was the incident commander for like four or five days because <laughs> nobody else wanted to do it and I was retiring. So that yeah. was the way that worked. Right. But, I, I, um, was a, I was a mobile foot team. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> I, I think if the citizens knew the actual behind the scene effort for every special event that the city, uh, the SWAT team uh, does a great job. Brian Bardsley, uh, the medic, the chief medic for the SWAT team, or there, another friend of mine, another great guy. Um, but the SWAT and special operations for the fire department and then the mobile medical response unit, the, the, the teamwork and the effort that goes into every special event to actually have a physical conversation before each day starts, wherever that special event is, Taste of Chicago. Fourth of July, uh, anything that goes on in the city, New Year's Eve, right? Any large scale special event. What are we going to do if this happens? What are we going to do if this happens? What do we, and run down the litany list of things that could possibly happen a car bomb, an active shooter, a drowning, uh, lost child. I mean, the spectrum is gigantic, right? And we try to cover all those bases every morning at roll call ad nauseum, right? And then we all exchange phone numbers. And we all go our separate ways and we all check in with each other at lunchtime or dinner time to make sure things are going okay. I mean, that's, uh, we're lucky to be able to do that. And in this city, I mean, with the lakefront as a backdrop for most of those events, I mean, it's, it's pretty cool, man. And, it's and pretty every, fun. And all that, that list that you just uh, rattled off at any big event, we're going to have all that, you know, whether it's founded or not, it's, we're going to have those runs. Well, you have to be thinking about it. And yeah. that's the climate that we live in now. And uh, that's how fire departments have changed, uh, not only locally, but nationally. And that's why training with the Illinois Fire Service Institute and mayors like Mayor Lightfoot stepping up and supporting the fire department and local to his leadership and every other small town or large town's leadership to be able to provide resources and training and equipment so that we can respond to the citizens in their time of need without fail. And it's what we all signed up for. We just need the politicians to support us. And uh, they don't always do that. Yeah, yeah I mean, going back to uh, you know, a lot of our, a lot of the people that, or not a lot, but um, some of the people that listen to us, you know, they're not necessarily coming from a fire service background or whatever. And like, you know, we, 
we get paid a, a modest amount of money for what we're doing. And, and going back to what we were talking about before, it's not like we can show up to this event and we get a call for an explosion and be like, oh, no. I'm not handling that one. Yeah, we like, that's, sorry. Not, that's not my thing today. Not you know? trained in right. that. Yeah. Can't help you. Know, like we, it sounds ridiculous to talk about the explosion or the or the car bomb that happens at, at uh, the Taste of Chicago or the Taste of whatever town USA, but we need to talk about these things because we because when it happens it happens and it, it doesn't it doesn't matter what your you know what you have for breakfast that day it doesn't matter you know uh you know what i didn't get a chance to shower this morning you know and whatever it happens it happens and, and we're showing up for it yeah but when bobby hoff was the fire commissioner he sent uh kevin krasnick and i out to boston to grade a uh, full-scale disaster exercise in boston for like a long weekend. And uh, of course we went to a Cubs game, you know, at Fenway when <laughs> the Cubs were playing uh, the Bull Red Sox and we had a great weekend. But long story short was we were out there before the Boston bombings and to see the cooperation of the local agencies that all surrounded the city of Boston and how they had really pre-thought uh, what could possibly happen. We could have an active shooter, we could have a bombing, we could have a release of... Uh, uh, some type of noxious agent that would affect the citizenry here. How are we going to respond as a regional jurisdiction to support each other in a time of need? And because they did that, in my opinion, and if you talk to Kevin Krasnick, who retired a few oh. years ago, uh, who was the chief of safety when he retired and, and then went to the 16th Battalion, I, I mean, those huge training events to be able to work with partner agencies like SWAT, CDOT, who has all our heavy equipment here in the city of Chicago is really integral into being able to respond to a large scale incident like happened in New York in 9-11 and then happened in Boston during the Boston uh, marathon bombing. And those guys in Boston, those guys and girls in Boston, the coppers and the firefighters and the nurses and the paramedics out there, man, they knocked it out of the park when that happened. And it's because they trained because they talked about what could happen. What's the worst case scenario. And that happens in this city all the time. I mean, I'm not going to talk about it, obviously, in a, in a public forum, but those discussions are had by members of the police department and members of the fire department who do work every day on the street, not office people, not office mouses, who lay awake at nighttime thinking about what could possibly happen in the, in the, in the United States' third largest city. And that's a lot of responsibility, and it takes a lot of training, and it takes a lot of money. You know, uh, we, you know, talking back to the, to the collapse that you had, I mean, it's not often that you had a collapse that was, that was at a certain time of day. You happen to be one of the leaders in charge of this operation and things happen to go well, but the general public does not hear about operations or on general instance, you don't hear about operations that happen where there was a successful outcome. Normally, will you know the the media will cover an incident where there was a mass casualty incident or or a lot of deaths and and again you you normally don't hear about the good that we're doing day to day well, every single day. Yeah, it's, Corey, it's the, the, the expectation is that we're going to come and we're going to fix it. Right. That's the general public's expectation. And then when you tell the public, oh, you know, this is what this is what Vince Zittman made last year. Oh well. That's a little exorbitant, don't you think? Yeah, well, no, not really. I don't think that. Vince made that because of how many days he worked, this, the amount of days of overtime he worked. This is the extra bike team deployments that he did. Uh, Vince was away from his family quite a bit, and he was available to respond at a moment's notice. He responded to some large-scale incidents, but sometimes he didn't either. So what I think what we're going to come into in the next 10 to 20 years in the fire service and public agency response is what – what are people willing to pay for? That's the question that has to be asked because I don't think they realize that, especially in, I mean, how many guys are on your engine in your city? Three. Three, right? So That's full staff, if, Corey? At full staff, four. Upwards, but, but most, upwards but most, of four. But, but most, never, most never less three? than three. Sometimes two. So let's, let, minimum, let's talk man, about the we'll elephant in the room. 80% of fire departments in the country are volunteer agencies. Right, 80% of fire departments in the country roll out with two guys, yep. sometimes maybe one. Yep. 
right? And the public expects the level of service that FDNY, Chicago, LA delivers all the time. And then when they don't get that service, they're like, what do you mean it costs money? Well, yeah, it costs money to provide uh, a responsible, uh, intelligent rescue professional. service. Yeah. Professional rescue service. And what are people willing to pay for? I mean, that's the question that has to be asked, right? right? Well, uh, it, but when you look at the city of Chicago taxes as compared to the taxes in your town, I think my city of Chicago taxes, and I'm, I'm, I might be wrong, but I think they're like $1,700 of my tax bill, maybe a little less. For emergency services. For everything. City of Chicago uh, offers. That's snow plowing, trash removal. Uh, water. Uh, no, uh, water's, no, a, water's, water's a little right. extra. Water and sewer's a little extra. But if you ask me today... Uh, Bang for the buck. Bang for the buck. Is that worth it? Yeah. Yeah. I know that I'm going to get, you know, two engines, two trucks, a chief, a rich truck and a rich chief at a working fire in my bungalow in my house. I'm going to get 30 guys sent to my house that'll do anything to come inside the door and get my family, take care of my kids. That's huge. And that costs money. And it costs money where you work yeah. too. Yeah. You, you cross our own. You, yeah. you cross the street and... Yeah. You know, the next block over, you have our yeah. fire department that shows up. It's crazy, and, right, Corey? You yeah. literally cross one street and you go from having 30 guys at a fire to now you're, you know, you're, you could possibly start off with two guys showing up at your fire. Right, right. Yeah. And, and, build, on, and building from there. Christmas morning, there's the possibility of that happening, yeah. you know, uh, for four guys and, and two engines, you know, guys, as well as. Do you guys use the city for mutual aid? Um. Not, uh, not as a primary response. Yeah, why not? Um, they work west. They 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 go start. west to you. Yeah, oh. yeah. yeah. Okay. So we'll work with uh, we'll work with guys like Franken Park and River Grove and uh, Melrose and then uh, well, River Grove's all city guys, anyways. <laughs> yeah, you heard it here first. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, and, and again, like that's that's the beauty of the institute's training that we've had, and that's something that I I gotta say, coming from my department is has been you know. Really, really helped me feel at home is that like your guys' training has, you know, I, I've heard each of you guys each day that I've had a class with you say, you know, I might be from Chicago, but I know that this is not how every town operates, Correct. you know, and we're, you know, again, humbly is another word to talk about, but it's, I know a lot of towns are not getting this same response that we've dealt with. And, you know, how do we, it's not a matter of, you know, how do we change things down to the, you know, to the contract level? It's like, okay, well, this is, this is the shit sandwich we were dealt. Like, how do we make the best of this and, and work with the situation? And, and again, the Institute's been wonderful. Every guy that you guys have and, and from all aspects of the job and from all around, at least the state. And I know you guys are, you guys got people from outside too. That like yeah, we, been, we, we employ people from all over the state and all over the country to come in and teach firefighters from anywhere. And uh, it's a really underutilized resource in my yeah. opinion. And there's a ton of money out there, even for the suburbs, to take free classes. Yeah, the, Corner, the about cornerstone the, program that uh, Danny Brack and, and Richie Stack manage here in uh, Metropolitan Chicago and the yeah. and the five uh, county area, and then we have other regional reps that manage free classes. I mean, any fire chief can call us up, and we'll deliver a free class, no cost. Yeah. Well, you guys went out to We've, Colorado and did uh, some training with a bunch of volunteers. Yeah, there, we go. I, I've been to China. Dude, yeah. I, I, the, the Institute sent me to China to teach structural collapse operations. I mean, they're a really great institution, an arm of the University of Illinois, that really believes that the fire service and emergency services in the state of Illinois is cutting edge and underutilized and underserved, and they want to be able to support that. And that's their mission, helping firefighters do their work through training, education, and research. I, and, I, I and, know and, I've been a benefit of it. We've yeah, taken, I, I, we uh, all have. I think if you talk to anybody in the fire rescue service classes with you guys, yeah. and it was all free of charge through, you know, through your Institute to be able to get these, these technical rescue classes. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, uh, it's been instrumental in my career. And I, and I think that's why I took the job there. I mean, I wanted to be able to have some input into the direction of the fire service. And there's a lot of whiz bang guys out there right now. Right. And I'm not going to mention any names because that would be uh, unprofessional 
and that's over a, a beer or another brandy old fashioned <laughs> at a private well, establishment. I, I'm still trying to get over. It. I still find the irony in the fact that when you early in your career you got in trouble for talking to the, the basically you talking to the press, and now by the end of your career that's been, you're doing nothing but talking to the. Yeah, press. yeah, it's kind of weird, <laughs> you know? right? It's kind of weird. You spend so, so I'm much still, time in front of the camera. Well, no, I'm still saying what I think I believe in. I just have a different mission now, <laughs> right? So, and what I'm saying now is more readily uh, uh, accepted than probably things I said right. uh, prior. Well, well, who do you appreciate more, the guy who the guy who sits there and tells you you're right every time, or the or the guy who's going to tell not, you what's I'm, on his mind? I'm Corey. I'm definitely not that guy. I can tell you. Ask anybody <laughs> I ever worked with. There are many a times the guys that I worked with at the firehouse told me, if you say one more fucking word, I'm going to take you out in the alley and beat your fucking ass. If you call me <laughs> deputy chief of operations yeah. and not Tim, so I, I will leave. All right, so. I, I forgot to tell you that story. So 54, I used to, when I was a deputy, I would go out for night visits at nighttime, and it was not unheard of. I learned from Bobby McKee and Dick The front Keating. door or the back door? Uh, I would always call. Okay. Right? Old school, always call. Hey, I'm coming just for a visit. And I used to tell guys, no shirts, no bells. Right? Okay. Didn't believe in that for the evening visit. At roll call, I would call and say, hey, I'm coming for roll call. And uh, right. so, I would still... So people who, who don't understand, can you explain what... The no bells. So there's that this, there's a, a written rule in the fire department that at the rank of deputy district chief, which is three bugles and above, if a chief officer comes to the firehouse, announced or unannounced, that who's ever on watch in the tower or on the floor would ring the school bells, the power bells in the firehouse. All members would report to the floor immediately, and if not in the day's uniform, they would put on the day's uniform and stand roll call, no matter the time of day. It's a very uh, official and formal visit where the bells are rung, people get to the um, apparatus floor and, you know, basically, you know, are there for like a, you know, improvised roll call. Right. And, and um, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, go ahead. Um, but, but to be very clear, Tim, um, and, and, You've asked us to call you Tim. Yes. Really very, <laughs> yes um, I, he I'm ordered us. Not that he ordered us. Thanks. Thanks um, a lot, Vince. But, but I mean, <laughs> it, you know, not to put you on the on the spot, but how many how many levels above firefighter is district chief? Or, or yeah, is district chief in the city of Chicago? So there's firefighter and fire paramedic. Then there's engineer and paramedic in charge. Then there's lieutenant, captain. Battalion chief, deputy district chief, district chief, assistant deputy fire commissioner, deputy fire commissioner, and commissioner. So eight levels. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a lot. It's not a little unheard, nonsense. Right. And, and, and again, very, very humbling and very, very stand up of you to say that, Tim, but like not unheard of for eight levels above your standard blue shirt in the fire department. It, it, it shouldn't be weird to ring these bells and get dressed up. For, I think it is. You know, I, for I, three I, levels below the yeah. highest yeah. elected yeah. official. It depends <laughs> on what you're there to do. Yeah, in the morning well, time, yeah. I always considered it like official, but I always called and let guys know I was coming, right? So you want to ring the bells in the morning right. for roll call? Because most firehouses ring the bell in the morning for roll call anyways. And they do a formal roll call out on the floor. They talk about writing assignments for the day, who's mm -hmm. cooking, drill of the day. They get their their morning their morning chalk talk out of the way in the morning. Normally, but the cook and think it's a little bit higher yeah, up on the list. You know, right? do the mass drill. You know, and the last step of the mass drill was always you know, sign the book, pay the cook. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you used to hear that all the time. You never heard that, Corey. Uh, never heard. Uh, you never heard I like that? it though. I might right? bring it over. Yeah, like sign it. the book, pay the cook. <laughs> so, uh, the evening visit is relayed to Dick, by Dick Keating and Tom Denellen and, and Bobby McKee, all, all guys that were deputy district chiefs before me and mentors of mine was like it's a it's an informal visit to check on the guys and to check how they're doing off the job how's their family how's their kids how's their uh, social life are things going okay and just a bullshit have a cup of coffee piece of cake i drank more coffee at nighttime than i did during the daytime because <laughs> i would try to make two or three houses every night but 54's house was always the best after they did this to me i call them up and say, hey, guys, I'm stopping by. And they'd be like, oh, what the fuck? Go someplace else. <laughs> right? That's what the officer would tell me. I was like, no, nah, 
you guys are on my route. I got to make the stop there. This, in I all try, due respect. Yeah, I try to <laughs> I try to make two or three uh, different spots every night in a, in a separate battalion. So when I got there, they didn't ring the doorbell, but they didn't have any shirts on, <laughs> <laughs> which I really thought was appropriate, right? So I made sure that orders. Right. So yeah, they, right. and that's exactly what they told me. Hey, you told us no shirts. So it was like a high school skins game when I walked in there, and Mike Winograd is the lean pony there. He's still there, and. Uh, you know, that kind of stuff, that's what makes the job awesome. That's what right. makes the job fun. You can't take it too seriously. Uh, you can't take yourself too seriously because there's all kinds of stuff that happens on a daily basis that makes it serious. So when you're not being serious, that's the best. For me, that was always the best part of the job. And that's the part that I'll miss the most. What, what kind of advice would you give the guys throughout any level? Uh, any take level. all the training that you can get, especially if it's free training. Listen to everybody and make your own decision. Mm -hmm. about who that person is and where that person has been. Take nothing for granted and have eyes in the back of your head and uh, be smart, be careful, right? Be right. mostly smart. Be mostly smart. Yeah. <laughs> because right. being smart will inherently make you careful. Correct. Um, while, uh, while we still have you here, this is a question that we ask everybody because it's a different answer no matter who we are at what level. What is your interpretation of where the term still came from? Because you've heard this, you've used this word, it has different origins to everybody. It's a definite Chicago term. You don't hear it anywhere else except here. Um, and we've had Father McNallis in here. What did Father McNallis say? I didn't listen to his podcast. Father McNallis. It was a curveball. Because he it, it was a curveball because he said that he was ju he had just talked to a guy, but he, his the roots of the origin of this went all the way to Britain, where um, he, it had something to do with a military term like stand still, waiting for the next orders to come. And it, it was kind of far-fetched, for all I know it's true, but where, is, where do you remember hearing the origins of that term? I don't know the origins. I'm going to be very honest with you. I've, I've done a really great thing in my career. When I don't know, I say, shit, Vince, I don't know. And I, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I know a still alarm is a basic Incredible. response to a fire. That's all I know. That's the way I was raised. But if you told somebody from another uh, city that – Right. You got to go to the Joker stand and, and ring the bells. They'd be right, like, because you have a fire in your still district. Yeah, right. <laughs> go to the Joker stand, pick up the one arm, answer that, ring the bells and, and key in the ambulance because right. the ambulance just got back. I mean, it, did, did you, I, did you ever watch the video of the telegraph system that was in service when, I mean, that's pretty cool stuff. I mean, I used, that was, we, uh, we actually, well, I don't know. Is there something that was going on? Oh yeah. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Really? Yeah. There was no, the, the, the computer generated alarm system CAD was not in service when I came Didn't on a job. Did you see the was video telegraph. on our own Facebook there, Corey? Oh yeah. yeah. No, I saw it. I saw it. I, yeah. The guys, know that's why I pop in. Um. <laughs> the guys in the alarm office were ridiculous and I was young back then. So I used to sleep pretty lightly. I used to be able to hear the alarm office click the key in the office to turn on the speaker to give a run. That would wake me up. I would not, I would wake up before they gave the run on the talker, oh, on the waker talker, right? So the next question is your favorite fire movie. Oh, shit. Wait, wait, wait. You're just making up a question? Yeah, yeah you're oh, right okay. on no my problem. list. Oh, okay. Right. It's, he's got a list. Got Ladies a list. and gentlemen, he's got a list. <laughs> <laughs> really? They're yeah. all kind of hokey. Of course they're hokey. Oh, That's what. And there's probably only like. Your, I mean, how your many answer is going to say a lot about you. That's why I don't want to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I've watched them all. Save Midnight Run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that I, that is a fire in a different sort of region, but I didn't know it was considered a firefighting movie. But I, I'll, I'll say Midnight Run. I'll go with Corey's answer. <laughs> it's a great movie. I like to count the amount of cigarettes. <laughs> that Robert De Niro. Robert De Niro. It, it was one of my favorite drinking games as a kid. Jeez, you, you could have made it past the first five minutes of that. Oh, I know. I mean, I, I, I think I got to 50 I, or something. I watch Chicago Fire just to see where Tony Ferraris is in every show because he's a buddy of mine yeah. from Squad 2, you know, and then I call him and tease him about it and I text him. But it's a great thing for the city and it's a great drama and it's a great TV show and I'll leave it at that. Well, people, <laughs> people ask me at work, they're like, oh, is, you know, is your job exactly like, you know, it is on the show? I'm like, of course it is. <laughs> It's exactly have, like it. Have you spent time? Do you think it's like it is? <laughs> then yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it have is. either of you guys spent time at 18's house? Uh, a couple no. shifts. 
it's ridiculous there, dude. In the in the summertime. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I've never seen so many people. And I worked at Forty Two's house, and I was the captain of Squad One. I thought a lot of it's people, like 78's house. I, it's worse than 78's <laughs> house. People come from all across the country to see that firehouse and to talk to the guys during that firehouse and talk about the TV show. It's, I, I, Is that the firehouse and the TV show? Yeah. Or so, the, yeah. So in reality, it's a great thing for the city and it's a great thing for the fire department because people really dig it. Um, you got a nice kitchen. Yeah. Uh, you know, but it's weird when you're given eight, nine, 10, 12 tours a day at that yeah. firehouse because people want to talk about Chicago fire, you know, but it's part of, it's part of the deal. It's all good. Right. right? Yeah. Are you with 33 years on the job? Are you still eating corned beef on Saturdays? No, <laughs> but and he's Irish. No, I'm not. <laughs> Probably have corned beef now, maybe once or twice a year at home. Okay. Unless I'm visiting a firehouse in the city of Chicago on a Saturday, which I I don't think I've done since I retired. Okay. So no, no corned beef. Okay. I love corned beef. Do you? But uh, yeah, I, it, I can't. It's just me and my wife. I can't. Deb. Uh, can't do it. You know when I make corned beef, my sons all love it. Do they? Yeah, so well, they'll come over for dinner. This year. And uh, what's that? I, I said they're probably never doing it on their own. You no. know, like th that's home. Do you guys no. have corned beef uh, over there at the? No, no, no. We, I mean, we're, we're. What do you guys do on Saturdays? Pizza. Um, Saturday we'll do pizza um, often, but not always. And uh, we're, you know, we're we're a little different ethnicity out by me, so we're we do Italian. gravy Sundays. Yeah, yep. I'm married to a Italian girl. Okay. Yeah, you guys have gravy Sundays. Oh yeah, yeah. It's like a steadfast thing; like you can't deviate from that. Oh yeah, we do. Okay. We do all the time. I mean, we, we, so here I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make older. you cringe right now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh oh. When okay. I was a paramedic candidate on the ambulance at 47's house, when we did corned beef on Saturday, they would do corned beef with the trimmings for lunch. And then they made so much corned beef that they did Rubens for dinner. Ugh. So it was corned beef for the whole day. <laughs> chicken and chicken. <laughs> well, well, they do beef and beef. I'm not now. I'm not making this up. This was the next part of the story. Richie Sturm was the cook there. Great guy. He only went to some bakery on 63rd Street. Party cakes. I don't even know if they're in business anymore. He only went to a few places. Party Cakes actually is Vince's couch nickname. I don't know if you knew that. I, don't know. <laughs> that I, did, I didn't know that. I'm surprised I just Dan, found that Dan Bracken did not tell me that. <laughs> but long story short, that was one of the meals on Saturdays. And then on Sundays, it would be beef and beef. So we'd get about a 25-pound inside steam around and make roast beef on a Sunday for lunch. And then it would be barbecue beef and Italian beef sandwiches for dinner. <laughs> so there was a lot of beef back in those days. And that's, I just saved the couch nickname thing for steam around. Yep, that would have been way around. better steam around than saved, party yeah. cake. <laughs> that was back when guys were smoking Lucky Strikes in the firehouse too. So, oh, man. You know, what's, yeah. the, what's the biggest change that you've seen over 33 years? In the there you go. Years? That I want to hear. Um, probably uh, health-wise, guys not smoking, guys trying to eat better. Guys trying to get a workout in, you know. Um, the toughest guys that were firemen when I was a paramedic were all guys that spoke like four packs. They weighed like 130 pounds. They were small and wiry, right? And never wore could, a mask. Never wore a mask, and they could go Hold forever. 140 hours outside their job right. as a carpenter. Pound nails, pound nails like for 12 hours rougher. a day. Get up in the morning with two hours of sleep. And back then there was no drug order, so guys might have stayed up a little later <laughs> than, than they do now. Not mentioning oh, yeah, anything. You're really paying the picture. Not, I, I like anything, it. not yeah. mentioning anything specific, but yeah, and and now you see guys making a deliberate effort, effort to eat chicken and to yeah. eat seafood and to not eat pasta, and that's probably the biggest change. Not smoke. Guys still chew, a little bit. You know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think has a, um, has, I mean, especially from our department, I think there was a period of time uh, right when I got on that they were making a big push health wise. They put out videos and stuff like that, you know. Uh, um, what was that um, video that they made? Uh, everybody come, everybody oh, goes home. Belt. Yeah, that was Bobby Hoff's video. Everybody goes home. You know, Sean. Great, great video. Yeah, Sean from the West Side was in there, and uh, there's a bunch of great guys. Well, that did we're, that we're video. trying to get Sean. On. Sean would be another great choice. Yeah. What a what a, talk about a guy that speaks from his heart, right? Yeah. That guy wears his heart on his sleeve. I love that guy. Right, I mean, another, another he, great guy. He, he told that story about going in after that air conditioning or that air conditioner unit, you know. And I feel like I'm right there with him, yeah. you know, 
when when he's going through that story. I don't want to ruin it for anybody, but if you go on YouTube, you can find it. Um, everybody goes home. Um, just Google it. You'll find it. it's awesome video. And these are like real guys with you know actual stories and stuff like that. And it some amazing stories. Um, All right, so let me tell you one more joke story that you'll laugh about. (laughs) This is what I want to hear. So this Ray Roscoe was the fire commissioner at the time, and I was lieutenant. I had just started working in special operations. And our oldest guy was finding out what high school he was going to. So I asked Chief Fox, who was my boss at the time, hey, boss, I want to run home. I had a city car. Can I run home at lunchtime and check the mail? He's like, yeah, no problem. Go ahead. So it was maybe a 15-minute ride from headquarters. So I go home. Long story short, I get the letter, you know, uh, our oldest guy got on New Ignatius. It was kind of a big deal. That's where he wanted him to go. Mm-hmm. So I, I was backing out of the driveway, and uh, uh, I almost hit somebody. And anybody that knows me knows I'm an excellent driver, and I state that 100% <laughs> unequivocally. And I'm not going to go into any stories about that. But he's got a great st- poker face. But, I really can <laughs> genuinely not tell if he's being But long story short, I stopped, and I didn't get an accident. And I waved at the lady, right? And I, honest, that part... The excellent driver part not, might, might not be true, but the, I actually waved at the lady. So long story short, I got back to headquarters. No big deal. I went and got a hot dog or something for lunch. And Fox calls me into his office. When I get back, he goes, hey, what happened? I go, what are you talking about? He goes, did you almost get in an accident? When you went home, I go, yeah, I almost hit a lady, but I just waved to her and it was no big deal. Literally every day I've worked for, my, for the last 30 years. Yeah, I, I probably have. It was, it was, it was no big deal. He goes, did you flip her off? I was like, no. Well, she just called IAD down the hall. You got to go talk to IAD. It's a true story. <laughs> I'm not even making this up. So then a Roscoe comes in, and I, had, I, wasn't, I wasn't high enough in rank to have an office. I had a, a desk out in the middle of nowhere, right, on the window side of the building. He's like, hey, Timmy, come here. I want to talk to you. I was like, hey, boss, what's up? He goes, did you fucking flip that lady off? I was like, boss, I didn't flip the lady off. I was happy. Brian got in high school. I waved at her. I swear to God, I didn't flip her off. He's like, all right, just go talk to IAD take care of it. So I go down and talk to ID and ID was usual ID. You know, they put the white light on you and you're a liar. And you, I was like, I'm not lying. This is exactly what happened. So for the rest of my career, and this is the God's honest truth, Ray Roscoe would walk by my desk and say, Hey, Timmy, and flip me off. <laughs> and Good did, morning. Did, How's your coffee? Yeah, it did not matter where he was. It did not matter who was in the office. And I'd be like, why are you flipping me off? He goes, I'm not flipping you off. I'm waving. <laughs> I'm waving at you. <laughs> True story. He well, since you rest, I, I almost forgot to ask you uh, a question was sent in. To, or actually, somebody I talked on the phone with wanted me to, I have to bring up you crashing Ambulance 24. Uh, so is, I didn't, is that a true story? No, I didn't crash Ambulance. Tw- well, I didn't <laughs> crash Ambulance 24. Were they talking about Ambulance 29 getting stolen from Little Company of Mary? That was the other story. Yeah. <laughs> So that's a better story. I'll tell you that one. <laughs> okay, I'll take that one. <laughs> so it was probably early spring, March, and Jose Gonzalez was my partner, and it was probably 3 in the morning, and it was snowing outside, and it was a Sunday morning early, and we were taking a trim, and we had not been to bed yet, and I was happy. It was like 3 a.m. You know how it is, right? 3 a.m., you're on the ambulance. You're like, four more hours. I can do four more hours standing on my head. Home stretch. They can't hurt me. I'm going to make a cup of coffee. I'm going to fill That's up That's when my... you get your second wind. Yeah, I'm, right I'm good. I haven't been to bed yet. It's all good. So long story short, this is no bullshit. Uh, the phone rings in the ER at the front desk at Little Company Mary. And I hear the paramedic room was right outside the ER entrance desk right there. And the nurse at the at the triage station says, hey, Amos 29, you got a phone call. Okay, so I Who you have the hots for at the time, bro. No, right? I was already married. That's oh, that that's was a, oh, okay, that was totally different you. segue, gotcha. buddy. You're going to okay. get me in huge Sorry. trouble. No, 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 no. I mean, he's married at this point. <laughs> so, I answer the phone. It's the alarm office. They're like, "Hey, where's your ambulance?" I go, "I don't know, outside." Right? And then the, I, are you sure? I was I like, mean, "Clearly, I'm hold not on, sure I'll right call now. you back." And I hang up the phone. <laughs> so I go outside. Ambulance is gone was in the driveway so i go find my partner jose i like jose where's the ambulance and are you the officer or the I, was the, I was the officer okay i was like did you lock the front doors because he had a bad habit of not locking the front doors <laughs> he goes i don't think i locked the front doors i was like oh fuck so now like if there was any blood left in my head and this occurred <laughs> it was all gone so i got on the radio and uh called in a 10-1 that my ambulance had just been stolen 
And then the phone rings again in the ER. And it's the alarm office. I'm not going to mention any names. I don't want to get anybody in trouble. They're like, hey, there's a report of an ambulance <laughs> in the Dan Ryan Woods over on Western Avenue at about 89th Street. If you can get over there and there's nothing wrong with it, we'll consider this whole issue null and void. So I uh, convinced the security guard in the ER to commandeer the security car at Little Company <laughs> of Mary after some very hardcore convincing that involved some explicatives and <laughs> me being irate. And we got over there and the ambulance was obliterated. <laughs> it was obliterated, dude. They took it for a joyride and bashed it up everywhere. Uh, I mean, it was, there, there was no getting out of it. There was no way that this could be fixed. So I called in the cavalry and reported myself that the ambulance was stolen. And I knew I was gonna. I knew I was gonna take the bath for it because I was the paramedic officer. So I basically just said, "I did it." That was the story that I came up with. The story was, I mean, what you actually super drunk. what actually happened was. <laughs> let me rephrase that statement. Was I went outside to put the equipment in the back of the ambulance, and I unlocked the front. We were still on paper by then, and I put my clipboard on the front seat, and I went around the back to put away the equipment. My partner was inside using the facilities. And I, after I got out of the back of the ambulance, two guys stole my ambulance. <laughs> and uh, they were like, is that what you're going with? And Bob Reka, who's been on the show, was the investigating officer. He's like, is that what you're going with? Because I don't think that's what happened. And I was like, chief, it's my responsibility. I did it. That's what happened. And thankfully for me, the investigating officer was a guy by the name of Hobie Hojack from the Evergreen Park Fire Department. <laughs> Police Department. Who was the brother of Lieutenant Corey Hojack of Squad 5. So I related my story to the investigating officer, which went down as uh, what occurred. I received a three-day suspension from then-fire commissioner Edward Altman. And I had a really nice party and <laughs> made back my money. And that was probably the biggest mistake of my career. Uh -huh. So... Yeah, they played Smash Up Derby with that thing all through 95th Street and North Beverly and then ditched it in the there woods. Was a, there was a mailbox. I thought I was getting fired. Honestly, God. Yeah. Cortez Trotter was the commissioner of EMS at the time. I thought I was getting fired. And the best part of the story is, and I'm not making this part up either, is Cesar Blanco was a district commander. He was the on-duty district chief for EMS at the time. Uh, we had a conversation with the medical staff there, and Cheryl Mahalik, who's Brent Mahalik's aunt. Brent Mahalik was a fireman with me on 116 was the EMS coordinator. She was working that night. And there was an ER nurse in the ER, and I swear to God his name is Joseph Doe. That is his legal given name. D-O-E? D-O-E. <laughs> right? And Joe Doe was a friend of ours. And back in the day when you were on the ambulance, I don't know if you did this or if you still do this anymore, we used to bring coffee cakes to all the hospitals that we went to because it was inevitable that something bad was going to happen to us a mistake or something that we overlooked. Yeah, look at Cody laughing because uh, right? he's, he's, he's had to do the same buttering up. Something that we overlooked, right? And we wanted to make sure that all the skids were greased appropriately for a long period of time until we had to call in our favor. So long story short, I talked to the ER staff and said, hey, listen, my ambulance just got stolen. There's going to be people here investigating it. If anybody asks you what happened, it's my fault. It's Tim's fault. He unlocked the ambulance. That's the story that I'm telling everybody, or that's, I mean, that's what occurred. <laughs> and uh, so when Blanco got there, he like let into this guy. He didn't believe his name was Joe Doe. <laughs> and he had a hissy fit. Uh, that this guy the, wouldn't give him his real name? This guy wouldn't give him his real name because he was a chief. You know, he had the silver oak leaves on his collar. They're protecting him. <laughs> and they're protecting me. And he's like, what am I protecting about? He said he did it. There's no investigation here. <laughs> And uh, he ended up getting in trouble, a lot of trouble. He got in more trouble than I did, right? And all he did was come there to investigate the theft of the ammo. So, I mean, they didn't know what to do with me because I was like, yep, I did it. For the first time in my career, I took responsibility for myself. And this poor guy got yeah, in trouble for giving his given name. Yep. So, yeah. The ammo's 24, I didn't crash. I don't remember crashing that. They might have been talking about crashing a buggy. <laughs> but I'm an excellent driver. This is how, yeah. yeah. All right, well, Excellent driver. 
I thought uh, maybe it was you who put the buggy in that lake one, at one time. Nope, that wasn't me. <laughs> nope, thank God that wasn't me. I can't take credit for that one. I swear to God on my kids, I didn't do that one. That wasn't me. <laughs> well, we're going to investigate that thoroughly. You better not be. I will to us. own up to it. <laughs> I will own up to it if I did it. Well, any uh, anything else? Any last words? You want to uh, anything you want to um, uh, promote? Uh, I, I mean, we can go to uh, oh, watch hold those. On. Uh, I'm training. sorry. Go ahead. I'm always talking about it, or I'm always trying to get one going. What was the best best ball boss throughout your your career that you've ever seen? Best ever? Yeah, I want to hear. It. Easy. Oh, <laughs> hands down, easy. Yep. When we were at 116. Uh, a lot of times guys would shop for breakfast on Thursday so that when they came in on Sunday morning, they had all the breakfast accoutrements there. They didn't have to go out and get breakfast and huh. so they could make breakfast early. Yeah. So we came in and relieved our brothers on the first shift, on the second shift, and they had left their fridge open. And they had five dozen eggs ready to go for Sunday morning. Yes, yeah, so we worked Friday. They had gotten off Friday morning, so their next day was Sunday. And so they had, I don't know, 15 or, we had 15 or 16 guys in that house at the time. So five dozen eggs yeah, was, yeah. was not really, uh, what's, hey Vince, what's the last thing you make on Sunday morning for breakfast? Uh, last thing in the firehouse gets made. Uh, the hash. Oh, no, it's the eggs. It's the eggs, dude. Always the eggs. Always the eggs. So Eddie Ryan. Oh, the, you, in the order in which you. Yeah. Oh, the order in which you cook the yeah. implements. So you make the potatoes, you make sausage, you make bacon, you make French toast, pancakes, whatever you're having. So you always make the eggs. So Eddie, the last five minutes before. Eddie Ryan, who was a relief lieutenant at the time, he retired as a battalion chief, another great guy. And his son, Kevin, is on the job now, really good guy. Said, hey, those fuckers are having breakfast Sunday. Let's fucking hard boil all their eggs. <laughs> Oh, man, I like this one. Right? This is a slow burn. This is a great one. Yeah. So you spend an hour and a half or two hours making breakfast on a Sunday morning, and you go to make eggs, right? So there's five dozen beautifully packaged eggs. Not, not a, a crack. crack. Nothing's open. They're all in the container. They're Perfect. back in the fridge after a hard Museum boil. Museum quality you go, eggs. You go through in the every one to make fried eggs or scrambled eggs. They're fucking all hard boiled. They ended up making egg salad. They knew we did it because we locked the fridge after we were done. And uh, that was one of my all-time favorite. I Let's get everybody. Like yeah. That and that was compliments to Eddie Ryan. Oh, oh. I'm so happy. <laughs> Isn't that a great one? <laughs> Guys right now are going to be, when they hear this, they're going to be like, fuck yeah, man. I'm hard boiling the eggs. I mean, I... I... I don't want to get you excited, but I hope that one day that, there's some guy in the Alabama Fire Department <laughs> that's like, holy that fuck. That oppor- I like, hope that opportunity just fires presents this himself. One off. Yeah, I hope just, that opportunity presents oh, itself. Oh, man. Yeah. I think that I think that's going to take effect at the Elmwood Park Firehouse I mean, long before it gets to Alabama. It, I wouldn't rule it out. I, <laughs> I hate being on record for asking these yeah. things. I should ask you after, so this I can't like no, that's so right. that it's I feel there. original it be, hey, when every, I fire it out. Everything there. in the fire department is shared. All yeah, good yeah. shit's shared. So right. yeah. and copied. So that's a I would <laughs> oh, love to yeah. hear I would love to hear that one copied by other guys. That's a great one. Well, I let's uh any departments out there who want to do it, it describe it as doing the Tim Walsh. Oh, it's the Eddie Ryan. It Eddie wasn't Ryan? my. It was, yeah, it wasn't okay. my idea. I would just. I was. I just helped boil the eggs. So I was like, I'll boil the eggs, dude. No problem. <laughs> so, hey, let's Eddie Ryan the second shift. <laughs> yep. Ooh. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you know what? And and before we get going, I, not to not to keep going after you guys with the with the institute, but um, obviously the Illinois Fire Service Institute is. Or originating in Illinois, but I, I gotta say, me, Vince, Steve, we've all been been reaping some benefits of of checking them out on Facebook. I'm not sure where else they're available, but if no matter where you guys are at, if you check out the the IFSI, the Illinois Fire Service Institute, on Facebook, you can see these videos for free, free of charge, and and I definitely recommend checking them out. Just again, it, there. It, you're not looking for, we're not looking for a writ incident in, you know, on the 32nd floor in downtown Chicago. These are, these are some, some great, great videos that, that are just Basic good. Stuff. Yeah. Just Basic good stuff. stuff to go over with your guys or, or to look over on your own. And, and yeah, it's bread, it's bread and butter about. stuff. It's yep. what the majority of what we do on a daily basis. And you got to be good at the basics, right? Yeah. I, I heard somebody explain it to me one time, brilliance in the basics. If you can master the basics and be brilliant in the basics, and if you're on an engine, be able to lead out all the lines. If you're on a truck, be able to throw ladders and make roofs and do good searches. 
and you can complement each other on the fire ground, uh, whether you're assigned to a truck or assigned to an engine or you're assigned to an engine that's doing truck work at a fire, depending on where you're from, mm -hmm. or you're from a rural community. But the amount of information that's out there, along with uh, U of I, Illinois Fire Service Institute, NIST, uh, the Underwriters Laboratories Firefighter Safety Page, there's so much stuff out there now that was not out there when uh, I got on the job that pretty much ties in how to survive. And I think everybody wants to survive this job and get a pension, right? So you might as well grab some knowledge and jump in for the big win, as they say, <laughs> and uh, get to pension and uh, get as many pension checks as you can and enjoy life because there is life outside the firehouse. It seems odd you know, I had guys tell me when I first came out, oh, yeah, hey, you know, kid, there'll be a day when you're tired of doing this and you won't want to do this anymore. Yeah, that actually happens. You know, it's weird to think about that when you're young and you're early in your career because for a point in time for me when I was at 116, it was like Christmas morning and I was 12 years old. I couldn't wait to get there with that group of guys every day. Yeah. We had fun. We uh, all hung out together on the off. We took care of our families together. We built houses together. We put additions on. And, uh, but that goes by really fast. The thing that, that, uh, stays with you is those friendships and the people you see after your job and the family you leave with after you leave the job. So I've been very lucky. I was raised right. And hopefully everybody else gets raised right too. And they take care of each other. That's what it's all about. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I can't thank you enough yeah, for having you on. Thank you so much. For um, thank you so much. That was, uh, Tim Walsh. I won't call him chief because he uh, yells at me when I do. Well, here's but, the thing. Uh, if you call him chief, he, he's going to go home, which we're, we, it might happen. <laughs> well, we're done now. So you can we're call done. me that as much as you want. So I'm, not, I'm not, not a big fan of the, con, right. the, well, the yeah. connotation. But it was a pleasure being here. Thank you so and much. And you guys keep doing what you're doing because I think it's important information to bring out not only to the fire service but the general public about what people do and how it works and where people are going. So thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Our pleasure. Oh. Hey guys, thanks for listening to part two of Tim Walsh. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it because I know we did. Um, Tim was a great guest to have and um, he, he big support of our podcast and, and another way you guys can support us. Great podcast. Really enjoy uh, spending the time and having a drink with Tim. If you guys want to support our podcast, how can they do that, Corey? You can visit www.chicagosbravestories.com. And buy a T-shirt um, before June because we're going to donate money from our T-shirt sales to Running for Heroes. It's Running, the number four heroes. It's our friend Zachariah. And if you've heard uh, the podcast uh, before Tim Walsh, we had him on, and he runs a mile for every fallen member of public service, and then he donates uh, the flag and any money that he generates to that person. So this kid's out there doing an amazing job. He was a wonderful guest, too. So yeah. we're trying to help him out. So any any T-shirt that we sell, money goes to uh, that young guy, Zachariah. Yeah. Yeah, he's a great little kid. And he's done a couple other local guys here, too. Um, you can also check out other items on, on our website that include coffee mugs, pint glass. Uh, we're still working on that rocks glass for me. But. <laughs> you can put milk in that pint glass. You're not obligated to drink beer out of right, it. Right, right. Juices but of all should, types. But you should drink beer out of it. Absolutely. <laughs> it is actually a great pint glass. The, the mugs are cool, too. You can get all of those at www dot chicago's bravest stories dot com um and uh again thanks to all uh the people who uh support the podcast and who listen uh we really really appreciate it yep we'll catch you guys next time